Valerio. Oh. Valerio, dove sei? Dove sei? Sono Valerio. in una scatola, non è che sia. I'm in a box. In una Oggi c'è il no profit day, te lo ricordi? No sì, ma... Oh. Yes, Siamo chiusi in una scatola. You know, perché non... Here, in... non ci immaginiamo più box. niente di nuovo. Non ci immaginiamo più niente di nuovo. Non ci immaginiamo più niente di nuovo. Dove sei te? Where are you? Qua che ti aspetto. I'm here eh? waiting Qua for you. Un anno. I'm here waiting for you. Ormai. It's been a year. Non più creatività, non We che... don't have any creativity. Non We don't più. think about things. We don't reflect. Can't you come to me? Yes, I'll be there for sure but uh, I'll be there if we want to change something if we want to leave out excuses and think out of the box because the world is not going back to what it was before all these excuses we cannot do this we can't do that well you know we had a survey a survey with all those that decided to take part in the non-profit day. It's about 4,000, 4,700 people. And we collected about 40 things that we often repeat not to move, to excuses. Yes, excuses. Do you want to hear them? Yes, we have always done like that. Or everything is wonderful, but we are just a few. Well, because the great ones were a lot. Weren't they? We don't have the money. We have never done it. Well, this works for the profit world, but not for the non-for-profit. Well, all excuses. We're just volunteers. Let's wait for a while. Let's think about it. Some Facebook is enough to communicate to everyone. The president says we can't do it. Well, you know, Stefano, I think that, uh, well, uh, we, we need to take stock of reality, and reality is what it is. But when we think of a non-profit day of the Italian fundraising festival, of any kind of initiative that we organize, well, the fact of thinking out of the box, uh, leaving out excuses, and trying to find new ways to face so today's reality, today's uh, real world, that's what it is. We need to get out of the box, think out of the box. Everyone did it. Uh, uh, but it was our choice. It's not because we were put inside a box and we need to make the choice and get out of it. Well, yes, but please reach out to me. Okay, I'm going to get out of the box. Uh, I've been here for one year. Okay, so see you later. Let's watch the video meanwhile. I'll
I'm coming, Stefano. Welcome, Valeria. Was waiting for you. Are you there? Yes, of sure, for sure, I'm there. A non-profit day. We have been working for months to get out of that box, but we are in an empty theater with empty seats. We can't really overcome this bad situation. But we were able to have the theater open. So let's keep distance and uh, say hello to everyone. There are so many people connected from all over Italy. And well, we decided to come to this theater. This is the Il Piccolo Theater. It's in Falling, so not in uh, Milan. Uh, but we really wanted to have a theater open because the seats are ready to welcome us whenever and when we will have the chance to uh, start again to meet, uh, um, for example, in June at the Foundry Interesting Festival. Yes, because we are waiting. We're waiting for our colleagues. We are waiting for people, for people coming to our next event. Why we decided to have this non-profit day? We did it because we want to get out of the box. We want to uh, say that uh, it is possible, even, this, even in this kind of reality, in this kind of situation, do things, uh, have a chat, uh, think about things, uh, and uh, uh, also being, um, let's say, critical or being able to talk about important things in the community. We would have wanted to have this chat all together with you sitting in these chairs and these seats. Uh, that one was impossible, but we are here anyway. So we are welcoming all of you. We are here all together to break this box, to understand how we can move on, how we can change. It's an important day for, uh, let's say, the newborn fundraisers or for expert fundraisers. And we have really um, reached so many people. And uh, we would like also to talk to, I don't know, board of directors, to um, decision makers in a way and we thought we wanted to do this uh, for the non-for-profit world not only for those who come to the festival and follow our initiatives but also to bring um, the members of boards um, or uh, those who are not really expert in fundraising but should become experts um, to, to be involved so uh, you still have some time to call them and tell them that they should listen to what we are saying, the fact that we need uh, more freedom in the fundraising in the not-for-profit sector, freedom to act. So if you are sitting uh, next to their office, uh, knock on their doors and say, come over and uh, let's watch together this event. Uh, for sure, there are new things, there are new details, so some technical details on how we should, uh, how you could, sorry, uh, follow this event. There are a few slides um, telling you that, uh, well, first there's a dedicated phone number where you can send your photographs. You see, uh, send us your photo. And um, well, the method, the best method is to send us photos, doesn't matter if you're wearing your pajamas uh, or your loafers, we want to know you, we want to see your faces. So this is the, the WhatsApp number where you can send your pictures. The second thing is that there is a streaming in English. So on the platform, on your screen, in the session, um, um, button, you can even follow the English streaming. And then there is the chat. You know that chats are fundamental to build our network, to know each other and develop a dialogue. So um, take advantage, advantage of this chat to send us your questions or share all the thoughts and feelings that you will have during the afternoon. Last but not least, I would like to remind you that there are also surveys on hoping. Uh, they are extremely important for us to know what you think and to improve uh, more and more our next events. Uh, OK, so here you can read survey, sondaggio. There it is. So what are we doing um, first? Uh, 
Uh, well, you know something about uh, what we are doing today. There should be a slide. It's going to start at 2. Well, it has started, actually. Um, it started at 2. Then uh, for a half an hour, we will be together and introduce the 14th edition of the Fundraising Festival. At 3, Dan Plata will be connected to um, have an interview. And then at 4, Stefano Zamagni will say what he thinks is wrong or right uh, of what Dan Palotta has been saying. And finally, at 5, uh, five guests uh, will be uh, online to discuss. And at 6, there will be networking opening. Uh, so the platform uh, will not be closed. You can. Uh, um, really have some networking coffees or, or chats uh, with others uh, and you can do it after 6 p.m. when uh, the question time is over. And here we are not alone because it's uh, nice to be in a theater even if it's empty but we wanted our colleagues uh, to be here with us even if not uh, physically um, they are going to discuss with us the topics uh, that uh, we uh, need to deal with uh, to get out of this box welcome and welcome first alessandro betti alessandro betti can you hear me yes uh, Hello, Valerio. Hello, Stefano. Alessandro Betti, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, well, you have been working for Teleton for several years, and uh, you have been managing and directing the uh, fundraising campaign of, telecoms, of tel uh, Teleton. Sorry. How um, has the non-profit world changed, uh, and what kind of changes can you see? Well, um, as you know, and uh, as uh, some other people know me, um, well, who know me, well, I've been working for over 20 years in the profit world, uh, in the for-profit sector, so uh, I've been working in the investment sector, and uh, a few years ago, I decided to change uh, to um, work uh, as a fundraiser or work for the fundraising of the Teleton Foundation. I think that that world was very unprepared in um, to, to, let's say, welcome people coming from the for-profit world, and sometimes they were even uh, preventing them from entering this world. But things have changed. Uh, first, uh, there have been uh, actually some successful examples um, of, let's say, combination between the for-profit and the not-for-profit words. And then there was a sort of um, idea, thinking that the skills needed in the not-for-profit sector um, is almost uh, the same as what is needed in the for-profit sector. But things are equally difficult in the two worlds. But there's a further difficulty in the not-for-profit sector. You have to do the same things, but you have more constraints. It's like being in a box with limits uh, and uh, walls uh, preventing you from doing what you want. Um, so, uh, for sure, the pro for profit uh, uh, things are also necessary uh, to the not-for-profit world and also the people. And, um, uh, for sure, uh, some of them are extremely uh, ready and willing to be successful. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandro. Uh, at uh, five, we'll ask you questions, so get ready. Giancarla, Giancarla Pancione is also connected. She, she is marketing and fundraising director of Save Children. Giancarla, I can see a face of your wonderful children uh, uh, behind you. Exactly, exactly. Uh, well, it's a very beautiful face uh, to look at. Well, Giancarla, you heard today's topic. Everything is changing. Nothing will be as it was before. Um, talking about your experience and your point of view, what do you think for the non-for-profit world? Will it happen the same? Uh, nothing will be as it was before anymore? Well, first, uh, thank you, Stefano, and good afternoon to everybody. 
Well, it is clear that nothing will be as it was before after a year as what we have lived, as the one we have lived so far. Uh, well, we know that not only the not-for-profit world uh, needs some change, uh, and the needs have been increasing a lot. Uh, uh, the needs coming from uh, all areas. Uh, if you think of education, for example, um, we saw that things have changed radically. And another important thing is that apart from the needs uh, during the year, the not-for-profit world has played a, a crucial role in fighting the pandemic, so not only in terms of healthcare, but also in terms of a fight against poverty. So uh, small and big, large organizations have all taken actions to do something more. Uh, talking about raising funds, everything has changed completely. There was some acceleration, everything has sped up. and. Uh, um, well, we had never had the chance before to do the same things, uh, to, um, to, for example, to, to, to work more, for example, in the digital world, and we were obliged to. We needed to do more in, in terms of digital strategies, but we hadn't been able to overcome that barrier, so we were forced, obliged to do it, and it was an important step. For sure, we won't go back to what we were doing before. We have learned some lessons, uh, and I really hope that uh, uh, we will be able to take advantage of what the pandemic has meant to us in positive terms um, and uh, try and seize new opportunities because actually we have learned a lot. We do not, uh, we should not forget it. And um, uh, that's really what we need to focus on, both in small and large organizations. It's time to be brave. Yes, exactly, that's my message. Thank you, thank you, Jackie. Uh, and uh, Nicola Contucci is also with us from Milan. He is General Director of IRC. Nicola, welcome. Welcome and good afternoon. Uh, well, I heard you talking I don't know if Nicolò's microphone is off. I cannot hear him. Are you with us? We cannot hear you, Nicolò. Uh, we'll try to refresh the page and see if you can. Uh, meanwhile, we can move to Valentina. Valentina Melis, are you with us? Il Sole 24 Ore. Il Sole 24 Ore is a media partner for us. It's an important Italian newspaper, economic newspaper. Thank you, Valentina. What about the not for profit sector? Is it having good results? Do you have some good news for us uh, or not? Well, I hope uh, I hope we will give you some good news very soon. Uh, so far, we haven't um, ha we haven't had any very good news. But as Giancarlo Pantone was saying earlier, and considering the fact that we always focus on figures and numbers, we um, focused on what hospitals were able to raise in terms of funds during the first weeks of the pandemics. And uh, the civil protection had collected 44 million, this Palantani hospital, 8 million. This means that this situation has been dramatic, but it really has meant a lot. Um, and is maybe telling us that we should be confident about the future. As for the reform, the reform of the not-for-profit sector will be a driver, and there will be three main things, in my opinion. First, uh, 
incentives for social businesses that uh, will have the chance to increase in terms of numbers in quantity and there will be more social businesses perhaps in the future the assessment of the social impact uh, of the organizations which is something new and it's something that should uh, push to grow and uh, assess uh, what uh, has been done and then the um, let's say registro unico or the uh, single the, the unique register of organizations well the reform is not possible without this kind of register well, because there are all the elements that are necessary in terms of transparency that are also important for donors who want to get to you know the, the bodies, the, the organizations, the charities. But, uh, you know, a lot of years have gone by since the first law was passed. And so uh, it's taken a while. Uh, well, let's not joke too much about things, but thank you, Valentina, for what you've said. Thank you for having been with us. Elisabetta Soglio from uh, Il Corriere della Sera, she is also, um, she, 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 she cannot be with us uh, because uh, she had some problems uh, in the family. She could not connect. This is a quite common situation uh, uh, at the moment. Um, everybody is fine, but uh, we would like to say hello to her and uh, uh, wish her all the best uh, for uh, her family. And maybe we will meet for another initiative in the future. Can you hear me now? Yes, Nicolò, we can hear you now. Hello. Hello. We were talking about uh, change. Uh, I've recently heard talking about how we were forced to, to change the language used to tell about the organization. Uh, for example, in your case, IRC, uh, your organization for cancer research, uh, has made this kind of change, right? Well, actually, we have all understood uh, that uh, this is necessary. Uh, the pandemic has uh, accelerated some processes that would have been fundamental uh, for any organization, uh, small or large, and um, also for volunteers that have become digital promoters for the online fundraising initiatives. Uh, roles have been swapped and uh, uh, changed. and. Uh, well, doing our job also means to be pioneers, to be bold and brave, to break the rules, uh, but break the rules with uh, a good knowledge of uh, facts uh, in order not to, let's say, um, succumb. But if you consider the quality of people and the importance of people, these things make the difference. It doesn't matter the size of our organization, be it small or large. In the last 30 years, I've seen a lot of things changing. And one of these things is communication. The language used in the communication has changed. Before, there were just uh, people complaining, whereas now we talk about, uh, about advocacy, about action, the use of different kinds of, language, of languages on different channels. Um, more, let's say, shorter, um, more incisive uh, uh, messages. And it's not a one-way talk. Our world um, listens to the needs and responds to the needs of people. When we communicate, we are not just talking, we are responding. And I've seen the not-for-profit world change and uh, become a dynamic reality, which is increasingly integrated in uh, uh, the um, everyday um, situation. So not just listening, but responding. This is the important thing. Today's event is extremely important. Um, it is 
so important, but uh, we wouldn't have been able to make such an effort on our own. We are so lucky to have on our side, by our side, some friends, uh, some partners that give us a hand and uh, they support us every time. So the main sponsor of two days event is Lavazza and in particular Mario Ceruti who helped us creating this relationship, building this relationship with Lavazza which uh, has um, gained a greater um, importance and an important role in the fundraising world. So uh, our main partner, the Lavazza group, uh, is with us. Uh, uh, so let's have a coffee. And there are another four friends, another four partners connected, uh, I think. Uh, there should be Maria Mar Amedei from Innover, and then Sebastiano Moneta, Data Prosper, Anna Loiacono, FastWeb, and uh, Enzo Torino for Unicredit. Okay, there they are. Welcome. Um, well, let's start from what uh, fr from a different kind of music. I can see a violin at the back, uh, and so a different kind of music. I'm sorry, but we cannot hear you very well now. Can you hear me now? Yes, it's working. Okay, thank you. Thank you for being with us. Uh, Unicredit uh, has uh, supported us, uh, mm, and so that's a different kind of music. Well, I hope it's a different music from what we've heard, uh, what we've listened to in the last year. But uh, Valerio, let me say that, uh, let me thank you for involving us, and let me say hello to all the people connected, there are so many participants uh, from everywhere with different kinds of roles and uh, jobs uh, in different kinds of organizations of different sizes. So they really attach a great importance to um, events, uh, to uh, talk about skills and uh, knowledge. And it's something we strongly believe in, as they do. And we decided to support this initiative. It is clear that maybe from a bank you expect an offer of products, services, uh, you know, of financing, talking about fundraising. Uh, we do it for sure with a complete and dedicated offer, but we want to go further and uh, look at the future, be far-sighted uh, and help those who want to be the protagonists of the future do something uh, tangible and have a social impact. Uh, with our banking academy, we created different um, moments of education, communication, marketing, digital, innovation, change management, challenges that, in my opinion, uh, will be the challenges of the not-for-profit world. And uh, uh, if I can uh, uh, talk for uh, one minute, uh, um, I would like to tell you that we will launch an educational program, and I would like you to follow us on our website to be the first uh, to discover uh, and maybe this new uh, program and maybe register. Are you going to play the cello, the violin, the, that instrument, or is it just uh, uh, choreography? It's just a scenario. Well, it's uh, my daughter's uh, instrument. Thank you. So, Our testimonials are the fastest of the world. FastWeb decided to support us on the non-profit day, and I'm very happy to say hello to Anna Luyakono. Anna, are you in? Hello, Anna. I'm here, and hello, everybody. This year, we have been working hard in order for Italy to be more and more innovative. We are a company with a social responsibility and we want to go hand in hand with everybody. So we want to give everybody an opportunity. We 
want everybody to have access to the digital world in order to study, to read the news, etc. And at the same time, we also go hand in hand with the non-profit sector because we believe that uh, you need uh, to help the weakest people. Thank you, Anna. Do you have any hobbies? Do you play the cello as well? Or do you play any instrument? No, I, I don't play anything. In the past, I used it to travel, but uh, at the moment, uh, you can only travel online. You're right, but I, I still dream. So if you want to promote FastWeb, you can say that you can even dream online and travel online. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, FastWeb. And over there, there are, well, on my right, you can see Marie Amede from Innover. Marie, are you in? Can you hear me? I'm here and I can hear you very well. We can hear you very well, too. Well, that's super. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, everybody. I am extremely excited because Valerio and I talked about this event eight or nine years ago, maybe even even more. The book Uncharitable by Dan Pallotta, I don't know if you can see it, but it was published in 2009 and we started to talk about this event in 2010. So it was in 2010 when we started to mention Dan Pallotta and the idea of inviting him to this event. Well, today this event has come true, so I'm really happy. And as a representative of Innover, we wanted and we had to, to be here. We're really proud uh, of being with you and fundraising is part of our DNA. That's why we are here and we are always very, very happy to be part of events like this one. This is a networking event and this is extremely important, especially in a time where we all live in our world, but we all belong to the same world. So thank you. Thank you, Marie. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Sebastiano Moneta, are you in? Sebastiano from Data Prosper. Hello, Sebastiano. I know you're not passionate about uh, cello or running, you're passionate about golf, am I right? Correct. And uh, my brother uh, works in the field of classical music. So he, he can play uh, a four meter cello. Valerio Stefano, it is a, a great honor to be here. Thank you very much for organizing this event. I was uh, with you and Marie when Dan Pallotta gave his first uh, TED talk, and uh, that talk was a source of inspiration for many fundraisers. We're really happy to be sponsors of this event and we work hard to hand something over to next generations. So I think it would be a good idea to sponsor a grant, a scholarship. This is another important uh, activity promoted by the fundraising festival. It's very important because uh, it gives us the opportunity to train new fundraisers. Well, thank you, Sebastiano, because uh, you allowed me to mention the uh, Master in Fundraising. Uh, this year will be the 19th editions, and we received about 10 scholarships, and uh, you are one of those companies uh, that supported us and supported our students. Uh, last but not least, Valerio, I would like to say that the world has changed and Italian people have been more generous in the last year. We could contact millions of people 
on behalf of the most important Italian organizations and um, hundreds of thousands of people have made a donation. So Italian people have been more generous by over 20%. So we can do uh, some benchmark and this is a great honor for Italy and all of us. Thank you, Sebastiano. Thank you very much. Well, these figures are really important and it's important to mention them. Sebastiano Moneta works for Data Prosper. That's why it's important for him to mention figures. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Marie. Thank you, Sebastiano. Thank you, everybody. And see you soon. Thank you, everybody. Thanks to our audience. I would like to mention an important figure. Last night at 6 p.m., and last night at 6 p.m., we counted the people who had signed up to this event, and the figure was 4,732. So 4,732 people had signed up to this event uh, yesterday at 6 p.m. I don't know, maybe now you are 4,800. Um, so 4,732 people signed up to this event. Wow, this is a huge number. And uh, I'm sure that we have reached a new audience, not only young fundraisers or not only those fundraisers who have been working in the field for years. I believe we have involved people far away from our sector and there is still room for for more people. The theater is still empty, as you can see. So we have managed to involve boards, activists, volunteers, and donors. Our donors represent the real audience. We would like to say hello to everybody. Unfortunately, we cannot. We know that we are relying on such a powerful line like the one of FastWeb. But uh, you are too many. That's why we chose the students from the Master in Fundraising. And you can see them. Hello, everybody. They are all online. They are all connected. And they, as you can see, it's 49 of them. They are all connected from their homes. While well, some of them were probably sleeping. So enjoy your master. And you are saying hello to every participant. I would like to thank uh, all the people working in the backstage. All these people are helping us and I cannot forget them. I wanted to say hello to the staff. The staff are made of people who are very good. I would like to say hello to Alessandra, Carlotta, Claudia, Emma, Giulia, Elisa. They are here with us. Please come to the stage. We want to see you. Please put on your face masks. Uh, let's keep some social distancing. Elisa, Julia. I would like to say hello to Federica. Federica is not here. I would like to say hello to Elisabetta. So I would like to welcome all the staff. So your minute of glory is over. But thank you. I would like to thank all the staff. So 20 minutes left uh, before starting our interview with Dan Palata. And now let's talk about our festival. Change Maker is the theme of the Italian Fundraising Festival. The festival will take place on the 9th, 10th and 11th of June. And we are ready to organize this festival face to face. So it will be a hybrid event, both online and face to face. And uh, I will let you know more about the festival later on. Changemaker is the theme of uh, the next edition of the festival. I received a very funny comic from a colleague of mine. And this comic was uh, about uh, the change we were forced to accept. OK, here is uh, the comic. So digital transformation is uh, years away. I don't see uh, why our company has to change anytime soon. And then COVID-19 arrived and uh, COVID-19 forced us to change. So we started from this idea. COVID-19 has dramatically changed our lives. 
So the festival will start from this theme. I don't know if you have already taken part in the festival, but the festival is not just a conference. It's not just a training. It's not like listening to a webinar from home. You can do it anytime. Festival is, uh, the festival is about sharing this experience with other people. It's about asking questions, uh, take the floor, and staying together. This is the meaning of the festival. And the festival will take place both online and face-to-face. -face. So if you want to connect to the festival online, remember, you will be part of the world and the dynamic of this festival. Well, I think it's a bit different to watch a TV series on Netflix all alone at home and uh, watching a TV series altogether. Well, maybe the content is the same, but it's uh, a huge difference when you are part of uh, a mass that can talk and do some networking. You can do it online or face-to-face. -face. If you do it face-to-face, -face, this is better. So the editions that took place in May and September, they were 100% online, and most of the people taking part in those editions said it's like staying all together face-to-face. Uh, -face. So thanks to the Hop-In platform, we were able to organize a successful festival. You mentioned change makers, so this is the theme of our next edition, and it's important to highlight this theme. Today we're talking about this change, and we have to think about the three days we're going to spend together in June. There is a video talking about the festival. faces, experiences, so the festival is a lot of things all together. The festival will be both online and face-to-face. -face. If you want to connect online, you will have access to every session and you will have access to every session live. You already know the platform and the location for the face-to-face -face event will be in Riccione, at Il Pala Riccione. This year we're going to change our location so we're back in Romagna, in the Romagna area. Some general information I would like to mention. Okay, there will be over 1,000 participants, over 60 sessions, four plenary sessions. There will be two international master classes, and I'm going to mention international speakers. There will be two mentoring sessions, and Valerio will talk about them in greater details. And finally, workshops for uh, big and small budgets. So this is more or less the agenda of the festival. And now let's focus on plenary sessions. We developed three plenary sessions, and the plenary sessions are the inspirational ones. The agenda of the festival is more technical and practical. Francesco Tese will be the protagonist of the first plenary session. He's a mentalist. He runs a program on Skype 
and he uh, focuses uh, on uh, the magic of human relationships. So he's going to uh, give a class on uh, the relationship between great donors, major donors, uh, and uh, the rest of the people. So he will teach us how to put ourselves in other people's shoes. The second plenary session will focus on the digital transformation. Francesco Ambrogetti lives in New York. He's uh, one of the person responsible for the digital involvement of the UNICEF. And he gathered four experiences from all over the world. So mm, they uh, come from the US, uh, the UAE, Kenya, etc. And together with Francesco, we're going to focus on the digital transformation and how it's changing our reality. And finally, a third plenary session, a final plenary session, where we're going to welcome the NASA vice director. He shipped the Curiosity uh, shuttle space to Mars, uh, Jordan Evans. So after... 17 failures, uh, NASA succeeded in landing in Mars. And we're also going to meet a colleague of ours, Nastasha Stolfi. So she will join Jordan Evans uh, on the final plenary session. So we're going to speak about three examples of change, a mental change, a political change, and uh, a personal change, an organizational change. So all together, we're going to work on change. There are many international speakers. Correct. There are a lot of international speakers. They uh, will be connected online. And this is a great opportunity. We can make the most of online in order to speak to um, people who cannot travel. It would have been too expensive to invite them to the festival, but thanks to the online, we managed to collect the best experiences from all over the world. On the festival website, you can find the agenda. You can see the agenda for the three days with all the topics, the names of the speakers. And uh, in these agenda, you can highlight the most interesting topics for you. We are updating this agenda. It's not the final version yet. And there is still room for somebody who would like to apply for being one of the speakers. As you can see, the different colors help you understand how to organize your festival. Mentoring sessions, this is something new. So every Wednesday and every Thursday, uh, through these mentoring sessions, we will do our best to develop uh, lateral intelligence. So we will ask you to do your best in order to share your passion. Maybe you are an expert on photography, on social media, yoga, trekking, cooking, uh, uh, privacy, etc. And uh, each of you will share his or her expertise. So you will be the mentor of all the other people on a specific subject. You are an expert on that subject and you're eager to share your expertise and your experience with all the other people. The idea of the mentoring sessions is to find personal tutors for each of these subjects. You can start from fundraising up to any other sector. And uh, donations and uh, the act of giving, we always mention these words. So our idea is to prepare a box, a toolbox. You will receive it very soon. This is a, a, a summary version of this toolbox. I can tell you it's really interesting and be ready to receive it. This, this is the 10th year of the IFA, the Italian Fundraising Award. Together with ASIF, we have organized this award for 10 years. So on this uh, 
award, we um, give a special prize to the best fundraiser or donor of the year. So we award the best fundraiser and the best donor of the year with a prize. There is a jury, there is a selection. Last year, every Italian fundraiser was awarded with a special prize. We didn't choose one person only. And last year, we all deserved this award. There is a very important date. It's the 15th of March. You can see the date. So on the 15th of March, well, this is the deadline for the early bird. So sign up by the 15th of March. There are still some days left, so hurry up and do your best to sign up. Come on, send us a picture. So use WhatsApp, uh, take a picture of yourselves uh, and send your photo to Carlotta. So please uh, show us what you're doing right now, where you are, and send us a picture of your slippers as well. Some technical data. Valerio has already mentioned WhatsApp. You can ask your questions in the chat. You can make your comments in the chat and we can share them with our speakers. You can take part in a hoping survey. So it's very important for us to receive a feedback from you. If you want to follow the English version of the session on the left button of the platform, uh, you can click on the icon and you can choose uh, uh, which language you want to follow. At 6 p.m., the event continues because there will be a speed networking session. And this will happen at the end of the challenge. So, Stefano, we are about to meet Dan Palotta. Well, in the meantime, I don't know if you are ready. I don't know if my technicians are ready on the right. But I would like to show you our video on the non-profit day. So, here. Here we are. 
without Malfatti, the world uh, wouldn't be the world uh, it is today. So, on the 15th of March, remember that the early bird uh, will finish, uh, will expire. So, you still have time to decide which kind of festival you want to take part in. But remember that special discounts uh, will be over on the 15th of March. Okay, so I think we are ready. I don't know if... Uh, we are online with Dan Palotta. Let me understand if we are ready to start our interview with Dan. So, Stefano, who are we going to meet at three? We're going to meet Dan Palotta. I have known Dan Palotta since 2009 or 10. Dan Palotta is uh, a really important character and uh, he has changed uh, the perception of the non-profit sector. He uh, wrote uh, a famous book and uh, this uh, book is uh, uncharitable. It was published in 2009 and uh, one of the most important comments uh, is one uh, is the one of the Stanford uh, review and the Stanford review wrote this is the manifesto of modern fundraising Dan Palotta has done a lot in terms of fundraising he was the inventor of the three day initiatives like marathons uh, bike rides uh, walks uh, etc We have a video talking about Dan Palotta, and after watching the video, let's start our interview. Um, a couple of remarks on, ten, on Dan Palotta. His TED Talk was uh, watched by over 4 million people. He also gave a second TED Talk on his second book. It's a continuum of the first one. And and about 1,000 people a day watch his TED Talk. So this person creates culture thanks to TED. TED is an important tool for education, technology, and design. And this should be the acronym of TED, T-E-D. So a short video. So we are live. Maybe you can't hear the audio. Can you hear us, Dan? Can uh, hear I can. Us? I can. I can. Yes, I can hear. Hi, Valerio. How are you? So, Dan, I have to speak Italian. I have to speak Italian because uh, there are thousands of people uh, live and they are listening to the simultaneous translation. So try to speak slowly and try to talk about your experience step by step. Okay, uh, parlo solo and poco di italiano, so it's going to be English for me. <laughs> so, so, uh, so cantare uh, tu scende dalle stelle. Perfect, that's the right day. 
So, Dan, you are Italian. I mean, you have an Italian origin. Your grandparents were born in Italy. Am I right? Yes, and I'm very excited to be with you and to be with everyone this morning. You know, I've, I've spoken all over the world, all over the United States, all over Canada, Mexico, Australia, France, the Netherlands, Ireland, England, but never in Italy. So this is wonderful. My, um, my dad's parents are from the south. My, my dad's father is from a little village called Vitorido in the L'Aquila region of uh, Abruzzo and my dad's mother was from Naples and my mother's uh, father's family was from um, Sicily and I've been to Abruzzo several times to visit my grandfather's hometown and I've, I've been to Milan and I've been to Capri and I've been to the Amalfi Coast and I've been to Roma. It's uh, uh, you know, it's the most beautiful place in the world, and I wish I could be there with you in person today, but one day we'll do that. And you attended the Harvard University, and uh, after university, or maybe even during university, you spent quite a lot of time on humanitarian activism. So what motivated you to start as an activist? You know, I grew up in the 1960s, and in the 1960s in the United States, John Kennedy was our president, very young president, you know, 43 years old. His young brother, Robert Kennedy, was our attorney general. Martin Luther King was in his 30s. And these were young people talking about love and peace and justice. And that made a huge impression on me. John Kennedy talking about the poor people in the huts and villages of half the globe, you know, elevated my consciousness about poverty and the conditions in which some people around the world are forced to live. At the same time, in the 1960s, the United States was engaged in the Vietnam War. So every night on television, as a young kid, seven years old, eight years old, you're watching um, bloodied American soldiers and burned out Vietnamese villages, and it's every single <clears throat> night. And you get this idea as a child that the human condition is futility, that we are unable to transcend our own circumstances. And that was very frustrating to me. And that was the opposite of what Martin Luther King and John Kennedy were saying. And at the same time, there was Apollo. You know, Neil Armstrong walked on the moon on July 20th, 1969, I was eight years old. I was, my eyes were glued to our little black and white television set, watching all of the different maneuvers of the spacecraft. And so that combination of things, social consciousness, the demoralization of seeing people unable to overcome the Vietnam War, and this incredible human achievement of walking on the moon made me feel like I want to do something to make the world a better place, but it has to be big. <laughs> it has to be as big as going to the moon. I don't want to do little things. I don't want to do small things. I want to transform things. I want to excite people. I want to delight people. So that's where it sort of began for me. <clears throat> When, when did you start to think that fundraising in the third sector was considered as something different? <laughs> in your book, Uncharitable, you wrote that the non-profit sector is discriminated. We treat the non-profit sector 
as if it were the son of a minor god. <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. When I was in college at, at Harvard, I started to learn about hunger. I wanted to do something big. I organized a bike ride across America. 39 of us rode our bikes 4,200 miles across the entire continental United States. And that was my first effort in fundraising. And we raised about $80,000, which was a big deal for college students. Then I moved to California. I happened to be gay. It was the 1980s. AIDS was horrible. There, there were no drugs. There were no protease inhibitors. You were losing friends going to their funerals, and there was nothing big you could do. And so I created these events called the AIDS Rides, and then I created these events called the Breast Cancer Three Days. <clears throat> they were long, long journeys lasting seven days, five days, over mountains, in the wind. You had to sleep outside, um, thousands of people. And we raised almost $600 million in nine years. While I was building that company, I noticed that we were being discriminated, excuse me, that we were being criticized for doing things that no one would ever criticize a business for doing. We were being criticized for hiring the best people we could find and paying them what they were earning in their for-profit jobs. We were um, paying for expensive advertising, full page ads in the New York Times and in the San Francisco Chronicle, prime time television advertising so that we could announce these events country. We were being criticized for taking risks. No one criticizes Apple or Elon Musk for taking risks. You know, going to a new city where um, there were negative attitudes about AIDS and trying to raise money there. Well, you're not going to raise as much money there as you are in a city like Los Angeles, but still you have to try it. We were being <clears throat> criticized for using capital. And so <clears throat> you began to see this holistic discrimination. And the way I described it at TED is we have the nonprofit sector in prison and the for-profit sector roams free. And again, the features of that prison are, um, we allow the for-profit sector to pay people based on the value they produce. And the more value they produce, the more money people can earn. You know, you produce more value, we'll pay you more money. More value, we'll pay you more money. But, not, but we don't like nonprofits to use money to motivate people to produce more or to innovate more in social change. We have an angry reaction to the idea that anyone would make very much money helping other people. What's interesting is that we don't get angry when people make a lot of money simply not helping other people. You want to make, you know, $50 million dollars selling sugar here. water Let, to let's kids stop in here, Dan. Yes, let's focus on this aspect, Dan. I want every Italian to listen to this part. And then later on, we will focus on every detail you mentioned. So let's focus on these. People are not paid for their value in the nonprofit sector. They are paid for their value only in the profit sector. So people do not receive prizes basing on the work they do in the non-profit sector, whereas this happens in the profit sector. So people do not get any bonus in the non-profit sector, but they do in the for-profit sector. So there is a sort of discrimination. You <laughs> Yes. You created a huge organization and uh, you gave a fair salary to your staff and you were criticized for that. Yes, in the nonprofit sector, we criticize anybody who makes a high salary without asking what value are they producing. If you're paying someone a million dollars, 
and they're not producing any value, then that's a very high salary. That's expensive. If you're paying someone a million dollars and they're producing $200 million worth of value, then that's a cheap salary. So we should never ask, what's the salary alone in isolation? We should ask, what's the salary relative to the value that's being produced? <clears throat> now, I'll tell you, even in the nonprofit sector in the United States, colleges are nonprofit, right? And college sports are a big deal in the United States. We pay college football coaches in nonprofit colleges $9 million a year. $9 million a year, and nobody asks a question about that. But if you wanted to pay somebody $1 million to end poverty, right, somebody who was actually capable of achieving it, we would expect someone to go to jail. Now, that's just irrational on its face, and it has this powerful unintended side effect. If someone's looking at this from the outside, some smart person just graduated from business school, and says, hey, I can go make a lot of money working for Apple, and then I can give money to charity. Or I can work for a charity and not make any money, and my family won't have any money. Which thing am I going to pick? Well, <laughs> I'm going to go work for Apple, where I can make money for myself, and I can do good for others. So it's a ridiculous proposition. It's not just about me wanting to see people in the nonprofit sector be paid more. It's I want to see the nonprofit sector have the same incentives to offer the best people in the world so that the nonprofit sector can attract them and they don't all go to, Fiat, uh, to, to Lamborghini and Coca-Cola and Apple. <clears throat> well, this is another aspect I would like you to highlight in your book, Uncharitable. <laughs> you wrote, every human being tends to their self-interest and uh, the well-being of everybody. But uh, what you're saying is that the collective well-being is less strong than your self-interest. So if we only give fundraisers the option collective well-being, while the best brains will leave the third sector. I think this is the summary of uh, the latest, the last chapter of your book. So basically, you talk about self-interest and collective well-being. This is a challenge, and finally, self-interest always wins. That's not quite what I'm saying. In, here's what we think. We think that in the nonprofit sector, it's all about collective interest. And we think in the for-profit sector, it's all about self-interest. Here's the problem. In the for-profit sector, you can satisfy self-interest and collective interest. If you go to work for Apple, and you make, first of all, if you go to work for Apple, you're making a lot of money. You're making iPads that help education. You're making iPhones that help the blind. You're making Apple Watches that can do an electrocardiogram and alert people to the fact that they might have a heart attack. So you're, you're helping the collective interest there. And you're making enough money that you can donate a bunch of money to charity. So you're helping the collective interest there as well. You go to work in the nonprofit sector, you, you may be helping the collective interest, but your self-interest, your family, isn't being satisfied. So, so you can have it all <laughs> in the for-profit sector, and you can only have half of it in the nonprofit sector. You know, a lot of a lot of people, young people, come to me and say, I want to go work in the nonprofit sector. I say, why? They say, because I want to make a difference. So you don't think you can make a difference in the for-profit sector? You don't think Elon Musk is making a difference on climate change right now with Tesla and electrifying the global automobile fleet? You don't think Lego makes a difference in the imaginations of children? You don't think the refrigerated boxcar, a big industrial achievement, dramatically reduced mortality? 
by dramatically reducing foodborne illness. This notion that you don't satisfy the collective interest in the for-profit sector is completely irrational and inaccurate. Very interesting. There is a, a funny example you mention in your book. Um, a person decides to work for a fund raising organization, and this person refuses to earn a high salary. And this is uh, considered as a good person. But a person working for the for-profit uh, <laughs> company makes a donation to a not-for-profit association. And this same person gets money and uh, a sort of uh, award, let's say. So if you consider the fundraiser, the donor and the beneficiary, the fundraiser is the only person who always disappears. E yes, right. The, the, the wealthy billionaire who decided to go make a lot of money and then gives a little bit of it to charity, we praise them <laughs> as a saint, right? Um, so there again, you see that the wealthy person is satisfying the collective interest and is satisfying the self-interest. Whose names are on the big hospitals? Whose names are on the big universities? Wealthy people, right? And that's all kinds of collective interest. But I don't want to just talk, Valerio, about salaries, you know, because that's just a small part of it. The, uh, the other discriminations are, are very, very important. And, and, and I think perhaps the biggest of them is advertising, where we don't like to see Let's talk a about marketing and advertising. Yeah. I, we don't like to see, donors don't like to see a charity spend money on advertising. They think that's wasted money. I want all my money to go to the poor people. Yes, but if I spend money on advertising, I can get more people to give and more people to give. And a lot more money can go to the poor. This is how we built the AIDS Rides and the Breast Cancer Three Days. This is how we raised $600 million with massive advertising campaigns. If we couldn't advertise, you know how many riders we would have had? <laughs> Two, <laughs> three. You know how much money we would have raised? I don't know, a couple thousand dollars, not $600 million. So here again, we let Apple indoctrinate the consumer in um, iPhones and Apple Watches. We let, you name it, Armani beer companies, soda companies, movie companies, clothing companies, fashion, hypnotize the general public, indoctrinate the general public, purchase, 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 buy new shoes, go on this cruise, buy an iPhone, buy this car, buy this perfume, right? But nonprofits, we want to remain silent. Well, how are they ever going to grow? If they can't excite the general public, about the work that they do, the way Coca-Cola gets to excite the general public about soda, they can never grow. They remain small. Well, the problems, poverty, suicide, illiteracy, those are gigantic problems. They can't be solved by tiny organizations. We need big organizations to solve those problems. But if we don't let those organizations appeal to the public to raise more money, then they'll remain forever small and we'll never solve these problems and this human suffering will persist. And how is that good? How is that a good thing? Well, increasing the advertising costs, uh, increasing the marketing costs also increases overhead. And uh, a question that everyone has been asking themselves, especially donors, uh, is, well, the result of that non-profit organization is good, but before this, the great question is, how much of what I'm donating is for overheads and how much goes to the project? And why do people ask these questions and this question is wrong, in your opinion? 
people ask this question because it's a very simple question and people like simplicity and it's very easy to calculate but here's why it's wrong first of all it tells you nothing about the quality of the services that the charity is providing so if a charity tells the donor 95 cents of your dollar goes to the cause only 5% goes to overhead. We all think, oh, that's a good charity. They don't waste any money. Well, you don't know that. How do you know they don't waste the 95% they're spending on the cause? That's where all the money goes. That's where the greatest opportunity is for waste. So you know nothing about waste when you know the overhead is 5%. If you took the example of two... Um, soup kitchens, you know, two, two places that serve soup to the poor. And one says 90% of every donation goes to soup. And the other says 70% goes to soup. Well, we've all been taught, give to this one because 90% goes to soup. But what if you go and visit the two soup kitchens and you find that the one where 90% goes to soup is serving horrible soup, it's closed half the time, the staff is really unfriendly, and they only serve about 100 people. Whereas the one with, that says 70% goes, because they've made an investment in their strength, they serve delicious, hearty soup. Their staff is well-trained and really friendly. They're open 24 hours a day, and they serve thousands of people. Well, now it's clear, this one over here, the 70% one, is the far better charity. So that question, what percent went to the cause versus overhead, would have betrayed you utterly and completely. Here's another important thing. <clears throat> Let's say there are two fundraisers, right? And, and one says um, only 5% uh, only of your donation goes to the fundraising cost. And this one says 20% goes to the fundraising cost. Well, we've all been taught, I'm going to give to this one where only 5% goes. But you don't know anything about the money. You just know about the percentage. What if this one, where only 5% goes to fundraising, is only raising 1,000 euros, whereas this one is raising 100 million euros? <laughs> what a stupid thing to ask which one has the biggest percentage. You can't feed anyone with a percentage. You need cash, you need euros. So if this one is raising 100 million euros, this is the one that you'd want to be a part of. So at every level, this overhead question just messes people's brains up. It just, it just leads them to the wrong decisions time after time after time. Well, it's a bit like when we think of a fundraising, uh, fundraising with uh, uh, the baked... Uh, cakes uh, outside the church should have the same overhead cost uh, as in a big organization for cancer research or save the children just to mention uh, well those who have been with us today like also Teleton and you will have a debate with them later well think that they can have the same kind of overhead expenses well it is clear that uh, with the uh, baked uh, cake, uh, I get a hundred euros, whereas another organization can raise a hundred millions, for example. That's the difference. Yeah, you want to ask about the size and the impact. If I said to a donor, look, I can give you 5% overhead, but never end poverty in Italy. Or... I can give you 40% overhead and end poverty in Italy in the next 10 years. Which one is the better investment for you? And also, nobody walks into the Apple store and says, well, I like this iPhone, but you, can you please tell me what the overhead is on it, right? <laughs> nobody ever asks that. You don't walk into a shoe store and say, can you please bring me the shoes with the lowest overhead. I don't care if they fit me. I don't care what they look like. I just want the shoes with the lowest overhead, right? No, you want the best shoes you can get and you don't really care what the overhead is. 
That's how we should be purchasing charity. Which are the best charities having the most impact, that have the best shot at actually solving the problem, that have the best people, that have the biggest dreams? Those are the questions you want to ask. Don't ask questions about overhead. Overhead tells you nothing. Doesn't even tell you about fraud. A lot of people say, well, when, I, when the overhead is high, then I know there's, they're committing fraud. No, you don't. Who's telling you the overhead is high? The organization itself. <laughs> Do you think they're going to show you that they're committing fraud with a high overhead ratio? It's useless for weeding out fraud. It is an utterly useless measure. We should stop using it. And, all, and my work for the last 20 years has been about changing the way donors think about this. Because the minute you tell them, the minute you expose them to these ideas, they go, oh, I never thought about it that way. This makes a lot of sense. So a lot of people will say, well, we got to do it this way because this is what donors want. Well, if you teach donors, they'll want something different. Yes, that's what they're going to want if you don't ever tell them that they're making the wrong choices, that they're looking at the wrong data. But if you begin to educate them, they'll begin to ask different questions. We will talk about donors in a few minutes, but I have another question to ask. Uh, um, well, considering that uh, there are uh, a lot of participants online that are also members of the board, uh, volunteers or uh, uh, presidents of the boards, uh, people that are involved uh, in the governance uh, of the not-for-profit organizations. It happens very often in Italy, as well as in the United States, that, well, you don't leave enough time and to those who have to do the fundraising. And, uh, uh, well, they are not allowed to invest, in a way. The maximum time allowed for the investment is 12 months, not more than 12 months. And second thing, if you risk and you fail, well, that's a problem. Yes. Um, you know, if you hire a new major gift fundraiser, you know, some, you hire a person to go out and raise money from the wealthy, well, it might take them three years to build those relationships and see results. Let's say you pay that person, I don't know, 100,000 euros a year. And at the end of the first year, they haven't raised anything. Well, many people are too quick to say, okay, that didn't work. Get rid of that person. But what if you kept that person on for three years and you paid them $100,000 a year, 100,000 euros a year. So in three years, that cost you 300,000 euros. You look at their results over three years and you find, oh, they raised 10 million euros. <laughs> it would have been a big mistake to get rid of that person in the first year because in the first year they were building relationships. They were building what we call a donor pipeline. Um, the second thing, as you mentioned, is risk. So we let the for-profit sector take all kinds of risks. You know, Elon Musk is launching a new rocket today in his attempt to develop rockets that will go to Mars. And every once in a while, one of his rockets explodes, right? Boeing has had all of these problems with the, with the what is it, the 777s or the 727s. Um, we don't put them out of business. We tell them to fix it. But if you're a nonprofit and you want to try some new fundraiser like we did with the AIDS rides, and let's say you spend a million dollars and it doesn't work and you lose the million dollars, People make moral judgments about your character. Well, that's not right. That, what that does is it uh, discourages people from innovating. It discourages people from trying new things. If people know that they will be punished for failure, they will never try anything new. If they never try anything new in fundraising, they will never find new ways to raise money. If they can't find new ways to raise money, they can't grow. If they can't grow, again, they remain small. The University of Southern California, 
they have a six billion. They had they had a six billion dollar endowment. They also had two hundred and fifty major gift officers, two hundred fifty fundraisers, full time, well paid. It took them fifty years to raise that six billion dollars. They raised the next six billion dollars in just five years. You know how they did that? They hired an additional 250 fundraisers, 500 fundraisers working at the University of Southern California to raise that additional six billion dollars. We, God knows, you know, Armani has 500 salespeople around the world. Apple has millions of salespeople around the world. If we don't let our charities hire salespeople to go out and convince the public to give, they're going to remain tiny. And you're going to people see people suffering from poverty and breast cancer and suicide for a long time. If you want to see conditions in society remain the same, then don't change a thing about charity. Because we have a charitable system that is really good at keeping things the same. But if we want to see the world of our dreams, if we want to see human suffering eliminated, then we need to change our thinking radically. Give us some advice, some practical advice, operational advice, because there are lots of very small organizations in Italy, uh, very small, tiny charities. How can you convince a board of directors to invest in fundraising when they do not want to invest? Well, you have to show them that the money invested in fundraising multiplies the money. So, we launched the Breast Cancer Three Days with $350,000. In five years, we turned that into $194 million after all expenses for breast cancer research. So if you were a board member of a breast cancer charity and you had $350,000, you got to ask yourself, what's better? Put that $350,000 into breast cancer research, every single dollar of it, none of it into fundraising, and make sure I get $350,000 worth of breast cancer research, or put the $350,000 into a fundraising plan that could turn it into $194 million for breast cancer research, which is the better proposition. <clears throat> so we need to begin to show board members that when you invest money in fundraising, if you do it correctly, and that's important, if you do it correctly, the money can multiply dramatically. And also, I would say, why do we have so many small charities? All right, if you're working in a small village, like my grandfather's little hometown in the mountains of, of, of the L'Aquila region, and you just want to help five people every year, okay, it's all right to stay small. But if you want to tackle big problems in society, then you have to get big. You, you're never going to solve them if you stay small. So you have to think about, well, what if we join hands with other charities and we merge with other charities and we become bigger and then we invest in fundraising and we become bigger and we invest more in fundraising and we become bigger. Look, we don't have thousands of tiny little cellular phone companies, right? We got Apple and Samsung. We got two ginormous phone companies that satisfy the mobile phone needs of the entire world. We need charities like that ginormous organizations that can satisfy, that can solve the problems of entire countries. Well, but why, if it's so logical, uh, because actually what you're saying is 100% reasonable logic, and uh, it cannot be um, attached, uh, sorry, attacked. Uh, but why, if it is so logic, we keep on thinking as we did in the past? Where this kind of uh, idea against the not-for-profit comes from, in your opinion? It's fascinating. I think it comes from religion. 
you know, when I was researching my book, I, I researched the early, um, they were called Puritans, the religious Puritans who came from England to the United States in 1630. And the Puritans um, came to the United States uh, because they wanted to make, uh, they came for religious reasons. They came to get away from the, you know, the, the Church of England. But they also came here because they wanted to make a lot of money. They saw a lot of opportunity in America for making profit. But they were taught, their religion taught them that profit was bad, that making money was bad. At the same time, it taught them that if you were wealthy, it was a sign that you were blessed by God. So this was very, very confusing. And so charity became a way for them to reconcile this. They could give small amounts of money to charity, and that would be their penance for making profit. And they could be sure they could go to heaven so long as they gave a little bit of their profit to charity. And in 400 years in the United States, that hasn't changed. You know, so how could you possibly make money in charity if charity was your penance for making money? Now, you might say, well, in Italy, we don't have the Puritan influence. No, but you have the Roman Catholic influence, and I'm Catholic. And what's the centerpiece of the Roman Catholic religion? Original sin, right? We are born with original sin. We are evil by nature. Well, if we're evil by nature, we need some mechanism to rectify that evil nature. We need something to compensate for our evil nature. And charity in society becomes the center of that place where you do good works to make up for the fact that you're evil. So, of course, you can't have any economic incentive in the, in the um, confessional box at church because that's where you make up for the fact that you're evil. <clears throat> so these are very old ideas rooted in old thinking about human beings themselves. You know, if we start out with the proposition, no, we're all good and we all meant, want to make the world a better place, then everything becomes logical. Okay, let's just do the most rational thing to make the world a better place. But if we're trying to compensate for this evil original sin, then you get these very twisted behaviors, which is what we see in our society's attitudes about charity. I have to protect the sanctity of charity because that's what will get me into heaven. <laughs> you know, well, uh, Stefano Zamani, who has already connected with us, and he is president of the Pope of the Vatican uh, Academy of Social Sciences. Uh, well, and he will talk with you uh, later on about this, and it will be very interesting. But let's go back to a very important thing. What can we do to help donors donating in a better way? What's your advice? So, to get donors to think in a different way, you have to teach them, right? If I want to learn how to play the guitar, I have to take guitar lessons. I have to learn how to move my fingers in a different way than they're used to moving. <clears throat> and I need someone to help me with that. So those of us in the nonprofit sector who understand what I'm saying need to begin to teach our donors <clears throat> that overhead doesn't tell you anything about how good an organization is. Overhead doesn't tell you about the impact that they're having. Overhead doesn't tell you about the scale of the organization. We've got to teach them that limiting salaries might limit the people who are coming into the sector. We might not be getting all of the talent that we want to come in. Limiting advertising might give McDonald's and Coca-Cola the advantage over us. <clears throat> limiting advertising keeps us silent and the public uh, doesn't know anything about us. Taking risks is important. If you prohibit me from taking risks, I can't grow. So we need to teach donors these things. How do you teach donors these things? Well, 
I, I wish I had them translated. I've begun to de develop a series of tools for, for donors, for English speaking donors. Like this, this year I uh, came out with this new little book. It's called The Everyday Philanthropist and it's small. You can read it in one hour. It fits in your pocket. It's got, uh, it's got big type and big graphics. And it's written for the average person to teach them all of these things that I'm talking about. Then we have this, um, this online training called the Bold Training that's for board members and staff members that teach even staff and boards to think in a different way. We have, we have these impact kits that we send to people that have all these materials. Now they're not translated into, it, into Italian yet, um, but for your English speaking participants, I would encourage you to, to buy those books. You know, and they've translated them in, in the Ukraine and they've translated them in Russia. Maybe together we could do a, an Italian translation of The Everyday Philanthropist. It's a short book, so it wouldn't be that difficult to, to do a translation. And that would be a wonderful tool. You can have people watch my TED Talk. It's translated into many languages, 50 or 60 languages. I know it's translated into Italian. So it's, that's an 18-minute piece of education that you can give your donors. But you've got to keep educating your donors, you know? Like we send our children to school and we teach them for 12 years. You've got to make it an ongoing part of your organization. Not just one thing that you said to one donor one time, but a regular curriculum that immerses your donors in a new way of thinking. Um, donor literacy, I call it. You've got to make your donors literate. So you've got to have a donor literacy program in your own charity. You've got to have a donor literacy initiative. Don't make the mistake of thinking, what is the one thing I can say to a donor? There's no one thing. You've got to say many things to them and you've got to say those things over and over and over and over till eventually they begin to understand. So you mean that uh, it's not just important to ask for money, but it's also important to spend time to educate donors and uh, tell them how to donate uh, and why. Uh, in your book uh, that I've already read, uh, well, uh, it's extremely interesting and uh, well written, you say and you recommend not to donate for just for emergencies, or better, to understand that there is a difference between donating for an emergency and donating to a charity that is engaged and committed to solve the problems from the root, right? Yes, and I would say too often as fundraisers, we think about, you know, how can I raise more money from this donor? What can I say that will get this donor to give me more money? Let's change that. Let's start asking ourselves, how can I get my donor to dream with me? What dreams can we come up with together for building a better society? Because if you get a donor invested in a dream, um, and, and that should be the only reason they're donating in the first place, then you can do magnificent things together. You can do big, big things together. If you're a donor, yes, rather than just giving to emergencies, ask yourself, what cause am I most passionate about? Like, what's a cause that has broken my heart? Did I lose a loved one to suicide? Does poverty really um, bother me? Do I want... Do, am I interested in children? And then let's say it's children with cancer. That you, I'm passionate about children with cancer, you say. Okay, now go find the best organization, the one that's really dreaming big, that's doing innovative things, that's doing things in a different way. Do a little bit of research on them and then make them your charity for life, you know, and give to them every year the way big wealthy philanthropists think of it. You're a philanthropist too. Philanthropy comes from the Latin philos, anthropos, love of humanity. You don't have to be a billionaire to love humanity. Everybody on this um, webinar loves humanity. So start to think of yourself as a philanthropist. 
even if you only have a hundred euros to give over the course of a year. What is your cause, the cause you dream for? My cause is to change the way the whole world thinks about charity and giving and overhead. And I've dedicated myself to that. You know, I've written many books on the subject. I give speeches all over the world. And this year, we have a major documentary film coming out called Uncharitable. And the actor Edward Norton is in it. And Chris Anderson, who runs the TED conferences, is in it. And Darren Walker, who is the president of the Ford Foundation, is in it. Many other people. It will be out this fall, and that's my next step toward my dream. You know, I firmly believe that we can change things. Many people think, oh, you can't change things. Really? Well, there was a time when we thought no one could run a four-minute mile. We shattered that dream. There was a time we thought human beings could never fly. We shattered that dream. Human beings could never walk on the moon. We shattered that dream. Civil rights, smoking, seat belts. History is just a record of the way society has changed. And this is our moment. This is the thing we have been called to change. Change 400 years of thinking about charity. It's old. It's antiquated. It's incapable of solving problems. We need to think in a new way. And so that's what I'm dedicated to, and I hope everybody listening will join me in that crusade by educating their donors, because that's the way we'll get it done. As I said, I'm gay, I'm married, I have three beautiful children, I've been married, I've been, we, my husband and I have been together for 20 years. When I came out when I was 19 years old to my parents, they thought my life was over. But that all changed. How did it change? millions and millions of gay and lesbian people coming out to their parents and their grandparents and finding love coming back to them. So we as fundraisers need to come out <laughs> to our donors and say, I am no longer committed to this old way of thinking and you shouldn't be either because it's wasting your money. Well, you know, the first time we met, you told me that uh, when you realized you were gay, uh, your parents sent you to a cardiologist. Is it true? <laughs> yes. Yes. I, uh, because they I had, were worried of your I, heart. I had, yeah, well, when I was a kid, I had had a heart, what's called a heart murmur. When I was, when I was seven years old, I had a little problem with my heart but it corrected itself. And they liked that doctor a lot. And you know, my parents were working class. My dad was a construction worker. My mom was a full-time mom. You know, they looked up to this doctor. Oh, this doctor Goldblatt, he's a, what a, he's a, he's God. So 10 years later, when I came out and said, I'm gay, they said, go see Dr. Goldblatt, he'll fix you. So I did, I went and I saw Dr. Goldblatt and he said, you're gonna be fine. When I have some Zoom conferences, I always like watching what the people have behind their back and uh, see the pictures, uh, uh, what they hold dear. I see John Kennedy and also your husband, your three uh, children. Are they your dreams, these pictures? Yes, they they are. They absolutely are. You know, my family is my dream. There's one thing you can't see. I'll show you. Hold on. You can't see my Saturn V rocket. <laughs> That's my model of the Saturn V that brought us to the moon. And I think charities need to start thinking about getting to the moon. They need to dream as big as we dreamt when we dreamt of, of going to the moon. Uh, 
I'm, I'm waiting for the translation of that. Um, can you hear the translation now? Well, in now your uh, board training, you said uh, that, uh, uh, well, not-for-profit organizations might learn a lot from the Apollo program and what uh, launched the American people on the moon following John Kennedy's dream, saying we need to go to the moon in a precise number of years and uh, uh, take back a man alive from the moon. Yes, I, I think what got us to the moon was not rockets, it was not technology, it was not the guidance computer. What got us to the moon was a deadline. John Kennedy set a deadline. In 1961, he said nine years. By 1970, I want a man on the moon returned safely to the earth. And when he said that, everybody had to get busy and everybody had to start talking about all of the reasons it could not happen. Well, we don't have booster rockets. We don't have spacesuits. We don't know anything about the surface of the moon. We don't have the communication technology. This conversation began about all of the things you would need in order to get to the moon in nine years. And if he had never set that deadline, that conversation would never happen. And there are too many conversations about social issues like poverty and suicide and illiteracy that are not happening. How could we end suicide in the next 10 years? There's no conversation happening about that because nobody has set a deadline. So nonprofits have to begin to set deadlines for the achievement of daring dreams. We have an organization here that a friend of mine started called No Kid Hungry. And their goal is to end child hunger in the United States in the next nine years. They set this goal five years ago and they have made enormous progress because they have had to have really difficult conversations. Once they set that deadline and made it public, it meant their reputations were at stake. So they had to begin to figure it out. They had to use all their human intelligence to figure out how are we going to do this. If you don't set deadlines, you can just be lazy. You can just wait for a hundred years for these problems to get solved. So I think the way we got to the moon was with a deadline. And that's how we're going to end social problems. Deadlines created by organizations that are no longer in this ideological prison that you and I have been talking about. Well, you know, the deadline, the word deadline really tells you that it's the line of death. After that, you're dead. <laughs> After that moment, you're dead. Uh, well, you know, in Italian, the word uh, is different. We do not talk about uh, a deadline, literally. Uh, it's something like uh, expiry, you know? Uh, it's, it doesn't give a sense of how important uh, is for small, medium, and large uh, not-for-profit organizations um, to set uh, deadlines uh, to say something. Yes, maybe you want to adopt the English word in that case. <laughs> <laughs> How would you say deadline in Italian? Morta, what? Cadenza. Uh, <laughs> no good, huh? Well, you know, it um, just reminds you of taxes that you have to pay, nothing more. <laughs> yeah. Well, you said that uh, you should also be ridiculous sometimes, that people should be ridiculous to make the charity world grow. Uh, what do you mean by that? Uh, uh, being ridiculous. What do you mean? If people are not criticizing you, if people are not laughing at you, if people are not saying your idea is ridiculous, 
you are not thinking big enough. You know, if you look at the great dreams of the world, they were all ridiculous. You look at the Sydney Opera House, they didn't know how they were going to build those shells. You look at electricity, you know, okay, you've come up with the light bulb. Now you have to put wood poles all over the country and wire across all the wood poles and you have to build power generating stations. Ridiculous. Someone comes up with the automobile. Okay, you got to build gas stations, fuel stations all over the country. Ridiculous. Elon Musk, you're going to, you're, you, one person, you're going to take on Volkswagen and BMW and General Motors. You think you're going to build a car company? Ridiculous. Oh, and while you're doing that, you think you're going to build rockets to Mars? Ridiculous. Walt Disney, you know, you're, he's 12 years old. You got this little drawing of a mouse. He's going to turn it into a, a, a global institution. Ridiculous. So we need ridiculous dreams in the nonprofit sector. We need dreams that make the experts say, that's crazy, that will never happen. Steve Jobs said famously that the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. Well, uh, through this non-profit day and the fundraising festival that we have here in Italy, we are trying to make some change. And I will try to be ridiculous, uh, I think. I will try to do something weird uh, to make this uh, reality grow farther. I'm joking, but really, thank you. Well, then, uh, listen. Um, I would like to ask you a tip a piece of advice for Italians. You know Italy a little bit. Your name, your surname is Pallada. And uh, there were some owners of football teams. The owner of the Rome football team was named Pallotta. Maybe it's your brother, I don't know. Mm, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> you introduce us. Well, apart from the joke, uh, well, can you give us a piece of advice, some tips? Uh, there are 360,000 charities in Italy, and many of them are extremely tiny. One, two, three, four, five people maximum. Whereas there are others that are very large, very professional and well-developed. But again, most of them are still very small. So give us three, four, five tips, very short tips on how to start tomorrow morning, start working tomorrow morning. Well, first of all, the, the Italians are a deeply, deeply, deeply loving people who care about others. So you're in a, you're in a country that is ready um, to give more, number one. Number two, educate your donors. Educate your donors with these ideas, with different tools. Educate your donors. Don't ever forget that. And the third thing I would say is you, you have to dream big. You don't deserve to be in a prison. What's your dream if you, were, if you were not afraid to say it? Would you like to see poverty ended in Italy in the next 10 years? Um, would you like to see 100% literacy in the next 10 years? What's your dream? dream big. You know, Elon Musk shouldn't be the only person that gets to dream. Apple shouldn't be the only company that gets to dream. Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook. We have the right to dream as well. So it could be that you join hands with many of those smaller organizations and you create bigger organizations. But you deserve to be powerful enough to solve problems. So <clears throat> you're in a loving country that wants to give more. Educate your donors and dream big. Those should be your, your guiding principles. Dan, thank you, really, thank you. Do we have a, a board or something saying, big round of applause? Uh, well, there it is. Applausy, applausy, <laughs> applause. <laughs> Thank you. And thank Valerio, you, Dan. thank you to you, you know. Valerio, you, you've come to the United States several times to attend my conferences. 
You've consistently tried to get me to come and speak to Italy. You've made this happen today. You're you're a hero in my eyes. I, I you know I think the work that you do is incredible. And well, we made it. We that. did it. Uh, <laughs> Then, uh, see you in one hour, drink some water, have some rest, listen to Stefano Zamagni commenting on your speech, and then we will see you later for the Q&A. Thank you, and see you later. Okay, see you in a bit. Okay, ci vediamo fra poco. Thank you. Well, uh, you know, Stefano, that's incredible. Well, he told us uh, something, and uh, uh, well, I was really uh, impressed by um, his ideas, and uh, well, it was incredible to have this opportunity to see him live. And it's incredible to see him in his office uh, with his pictures uh, in a T-shirt, uh, answer your questions, fantastic. Now, the call to action for the 15th of March, the date is clear. You'll have the chance to sign up for the fundraising festival with the early bird fee. And uh, for that moment, before that date, sorry, after that date, uh, it won't be possible to um, uh, have this uh, special offer. I see you in difficulty. I see you. Uh, well, no, 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 here I am. Uh, I would like to call Stefano Zomagni. I think he is connected. Well, the direction over there. Um, telling me that there is a video. Well, you know, it took me 10 years to take Palotta to Italy, so I was uh, quite an emotion, and quite uh, excited. Uh, so, uh, 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 a short uh, video telling something about Stefano Tamani. Welcome, welcome Professor Zamagni. We can hear you. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Well, I think that there is a problem with your microphone, your microphone on the cheek, so it uh, gives us some noise. Can you move it a little bit so it's going to be better? Thank you. Thank you. Professor Zamagni, today is a very important day for us, uh, and uh, we talk about uh, going out of the box, getting out of the box, uh, and uh, um, breaking the limitations of the not-for-profit world. We saw your presentation. You are a great economist of the Italian not-for-profits. You invented the world of onlus, so the charity world. Uh, you were born in 1943, you are a professor at the University of Bologna, so everyone calls you the professor. It's also, you are also president of the academic, sorry, of the Vatican Academy of Social Sciences, and uh, you are the prophet of reciprocity between uh, free market and capitalism. You have published uh, more than 30 books on not-for-profit, and you know better than anybody else uh, the Italian uh, not-for-profit sector. Uh, well, you listened to what Dan Palotta was saying, and uh, you uh, got an idea of the kind of mistakes or uh, right and good things uh, that uh, he said. What is your idea, Mr. Professor? Thank you, thank you for inviting me, and I was very honored. I didn't know personally Dan Palotta, and uh, I was honored to get to know him. But I don't think your question is right, because uh, it's not a matter of right or wrong ideas, but it's important to understand the context in which the um, idea developed by Daniel, Daniel um, 
uh, is at the basis of what happens uh, both in Italy and in Europe, because you should start from this idea. What we call in Italy terzo settore, and so what the uh, United States call not-for-profit, well, these organizations were born in Tuscany between the um, 1100 and 1200, and they were called confraternite. These uh, associations were at the basis of hospitals and schools, and American people do not know these things because, um, you know, I've been teaching uh, at Johns Hopkins University for 40 years, and what I say is based on facts and not uh, hypothesis. American people do not study and do not know what happens uh, elsewhere, whereas uh, we know everything about them because they deserve to be listened to and uh, uh, followed, but they do not do the same with other peoples. When I tell my students at the Johns Hopkins, Hopkins sorry, that the not for profits was born in Tuscany uh, during the 13th century uh, with the what we call misericordia, these associations that still uh, are present and nowadays, they are deeply impressed. But the origin of Italian not-for-profit sector is completely different. Secondly, uh, Palotta is right uh, when uh, he mentions the um, Puritans uh, and uh, the deviations that stemmed from that. But that's just referred to the American reality because in Italy, uh, nothing similar has ever happened because if you think of uh, Luther uh, and Calvin, uh, well, Lutherans and Calvinists uh, were at the opposite side. And so um, capitalism, for example, is connected to Calvinism and uh, uh, Puritans. Uh, so when he says that for Puritans, a human being, man, is evil uh, and donations uh, are used uh, as a sort uh, of penance uh, to, um, for those who have the money to use some their money in a better way. But in Italy, it's different because the Catholic religion has never, ever uh, supported that, has never sustained that. Uh, maybe uh, Pallada doesn't know that those who created the market economy were the Franciscan monks uh, in the 14th, 15th century during Renaissance. The first banks, uh, banks were created by them. The first was born in Perugia in, in 1462. So it is clear that the idea of Pallada uh, referred to the Italian context, context is ridiculous uh, and uh, makes no sense because the Catholic matrix um, is completely different, and the production of wealth is something good and not something evil we should find justification for. And the wealth, however, according to the Franciscan idea, should be participated and not just individual. Uh, well, uh, I think that the audio is not so very good now. Um, well, the, 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 the idea here is, how is that that in Italy after the Second World War, things uh, have gone as we all know, and those who are listening know very well, and also Pilata know, uh, knows it very well. Uh, and that's the core point, starting from the 30s, but then there was fascism, uh, and uh, so mainly after the Second World War, the tradition of the Italian thinking and the Italian tradition of the not-for-profit sector that has characterized, uh, that characterized, sorry, over 700 years of history changed radically because in 1942 the welfare state was born. The welfare state had never uh, existed in America before. They do not know it. But what happened with the welfare state, in that case, the state, the government takes care of the citizens' well-being. 
And, the, um, and Average, that uh, in 1942 approved uh, this act uh, in the mm, British Parliament, uh, well, made welfare state uh, as uh, the basis of what happened uh, in the years in the next years. So if it's the government uh, that uh, has to care for the people, this means that all the initiatives, uh, uh, all the charitable actions uh, uh, in the not-for-profit sector um, were meaningless uh, at that time because it's the citizen paying taxes, taxes that um, support the government that later on helps the citizen with uh, mm, the delivery, let's say, of services and her support. But the question here is, what has changed in the last 20 to 30 years? First, the welfare state resources dropped, and so the government and public entities were not able to respond to the needs of the citizens for their well-being. Moreover, the intervention of the government and the uh, strong intervention of the state in uh, everyday life um, led the citizen to think, uh, if the government thinks of everything, why should I worry? But things didn't go like this because the Catholic Church corrected that situation and said that it doesn't matter the money you have, but there's a love relationship at the basis, luckily, because otherwise we wouldn't be uh, here talking about this. And if you think of the resources that were reduced at that time uh, and the principle of the support given by the government led to the situation that we have nowadays uh, and the not-for-profit sector and I'm not the first person saying that is too weak too fragile not just for the reasons that Pallotta is just mentioned because what he said is true for America in my opinion for the United States here the not-for-profit sector is weak for other reasons reasons that um, are different. And I see that uh, the United States uh, invented the welfare capitalism when? In 1990, whereas the welfare state was born in 1942. In 1919, five important industrial uh, entrepreneurs uh, like Ford, Carnegie and Rockefeller signed an agreement saying that the entrepreneurs had to uh, care for the needs uh, of their employees, workers and their families. And starting from then, that moment, things went on. If you think of Carnegie, uh, he wrote a book in 1896 uh, and the title was The Gospel of Wealth. The Gospel. Can you imagine it? Well, that's a revolutionary book. He said that the entrepreneur, the business person, should not just think of making profits, but first and foremost, uh, to, should think about the well-being of their citizens and the people living in the reference community. Uh, when he died, he had four children, he left only 10% of his wealth to the children, which was incredible, whereas 90% was used to make a hospital that is still there, a foundation, a university, the Carnegie Mellon University. And uh, what Pal Palatis has today is true, but it's true for the United States and not for Italy. And we should be careful and avoid making a mistake uh, um, by applying a model or some behavioral rules uh, to a country, because these rules maybe gave good results in another context, but that context was characterized by a completely different cultural and ethical matrix. Uh, and so the results might be awful if we did that. But what is the uh, core idea here? When Pallada said, if the charities could uh, uh, get, let's say, directors, managers, and 
pay salaries as in the for-profit sector, well, in that case, the only motivation uh, at the basis would be the fact of uh, doing something because I expect results, um, mainly economic results. Whereas uh, there are these kind of motivations uh, in human beings, but there are also other types of uh, motivations. Some people say, I'm going to do this work, I'm paid less than I would deserve, but I do it because doing by doing this, I can get a compensation, which is not a monetary compensation, but it is an intrinsic um, an intrinsic uh, um, remuneration or compensation, which is the satisfaction I feel for doing that. So we cannot just think in uh, monetary terms. Uh, I uh, studied at Oxford and John Each and Marty said, uh, were my uh, professors and they got the Nobel Prizes. And uh, if they became consultants, they would have made billions because they were the best at that time, even now. And they said, no, because we don't like it. We prefer to spend our time uh, in being with the students. We prefer that relationship to give us some warm, warm glow. Uh, it's a word that cannot be translated in Italy, in Italian, sorry. Um, that word glow has, is priceless. And, uh, well, if a person does it, it's not because that person is interested in making a lot of money, money but in having this warm glow and intrinsic compensation or remuneration. So in the Italian not-for-profit world, things are not going wrong because people are paid uh, less, but because there are uh, managers, directors, and different people in the organization structures that lack this um, intrinsic remuneration. But where does this remuneration come from? First, from an investment in human capital. And I said human capital, not information. Not training, sorry. Um, if I work in the not-for-profit sector, and my organization allows me to invest in human capital by, uh, I don't know, sending me for six months in the United States uh, to study without conditioning me. Well, I think that this opportunity is much more important than a pay rise. Secondly, recognition, that's another point. Platon. Um, Plato talked about recognition and those who work in the not-for-profit sector need recognition. Uh, this doesn't mean to have a monetary incentive, but to let other people know um, what we do for the common good. Because uh, if there is a motivation to do some common good, well, I also need to know that the other people will appreciate what I do. And so, um, people in the not-for-profit sector do not invest in human capitals. And so, at the end, directors and managers are not able to do that job, not because they are not paid enough, because even if we paid them uh, three times as much as what they get, uh, um, well, they wouldn't be able to get the expected results for reasons. And the third way to increase the intrinsic remuneration is a democratic governance, which means in practical terms that those who work in the not-for-profit sector do not accept the Taylor model. And that model is based on the hierarchy principles. Uh, 
I could not work in the not-for-profit sector because if, uh, sorry, in the for-profit sector, because if I went to working in a company, I couldn't uh, listen to the uh, orders or obey the orders of other people. And um, I cannot just uh, do tasks uh, or a job because other people tell me to do it. So talking about democratic governance means these. It means that in the not-for-profit, and uh, uh, Valerio agrees that, uh, well, things work differently, but the problem of our not-for-profit sector is not that people are not paid enough, but first, that people are not allowed to invest in their human capital. And secondly, uh, there is no recognition um, and there is uh, rec recognition or stewardship, if you want. And third, you cannot apply that uh, governance model by Robertson that Robertson defined as holocrat. And it means that there are people that can interact, and even the person who arrived last should be in the uh, condition to to say uh, to have to have a voice to to say what he or she thinks. So, if we want to relaunch the Italian not-for-profit sector, we should start from this and it's possible to do it because in the past it was like that it was like that for 700 years then there was the uh, state invasion the government invasion the government saying these are the rules and i'm going to um, deal with everything uh, but mm, there have been uh, some bad things and bad decisions made. made. So Dan is right when he talks about the American reality, but if we translate this into Italian, the, the cultural matrix uh, and the ethical matrix is completely different because it's not the culture of Puritans. So you can say that you prefer Puritans to Catholics, and their ideas to ours, but you must remember that market economy derives from the Catholic religion. And the, uh, instead, Luther and the uh, Protestant uh, and the Calvinist um, religion is at the basis of the capitalist economy. So uh, I would really advise to other people to study a little bit uh, the uh, arrival of capitalism that arrived three centuries after the market economy. But we should not make history start from the 1700 when capitalism was born, because actually market economy was born in the 15th century. So we know that, for example, that philanthropy in Italian tradition Philanthropy is something that has never worked, uh, uh, or uh, we didn't even use uh, that uh, word. We referred to another concept, uh, to the concept of uh, patronage and uh, a patron, but it's different, it's something different. Uh, it's enough to study the history of art and see what uh, uh, at that time they did uh, with artists. They paid for the um, the, the work of art. Uh, they, they hired architects and they said, "But we don't like your project. We don't like your work." Uh, so they sometimes the money and also gave orders. But if donors work in this way, well, they do not just give money, but they give more, more money. And fundraisers, well, if you are good fundraisers and you are quite good, should uh, be based on this idea. First, you know, I work for that cause, for example, cancer research. But 
I would like you to be involved and involved because thanks to your expertise and know-how, you can make an incredible contribution to the uh, progress of knowledge in this sense. And it is clear that if this happens, uh, this person, the potential donor, the prospect, uh, will give you the money. But I'm not just asking you for the money. I'm asking you for a part of yourself. Can you understand the difference? Just go into a person and say, give me your money and then goodbye. Or saying to a person, I want to have a friendship, a relationship with you because I work for a cause and I would like you to work for the same cause. And then I also ask you to come to this organization because you're experts in a field to teach those who are in the organization to, uh, I don't know, make something in the lab and that uh, donor will think that uh, we are working well and double their donation. But in the United States, that there's a different model, and it's the model of philanthropy. Dan knows it that uh, in September 2019, Darren Walker, the president of the Ford Foundation, the Ford Foundation published a book and I had to reread the book three times because I could not believe my eyes and ears, called From Generosity to Justice. From Generosity to Justice. So the, the, what he said is the opposite of what Pallada said because he said that the United States and their not-for-profit sector, but he says that Everything he says refers to the United States. Well, this doesn't work uh, because it gets uh, opposite results. Because two years earlier, three economists from the United States conducted an empirical research, and they showed that philanthropy in uh, the United States increases as social injustice, social inequalities increase. Well. Italian people may say we knew it even 700 years ago because, you know, just giving money is not something that is in line with the purpose that we have. So the fact that the Ford Foundation is so rich and so important is also because uh, it is based on the idea that uh, philanthropy should change uh, the rules of the game, of the economic game. Uh, and this is what he meant by saying from justice from generosity to justice so change those things in the financial work to make that to make free market capitalist produce uh, results uh, that are not anymore because that market generated poverty and inequalities, but we need to be clear and understand if we want to recognize free market capitalism as being uh, exclusive and generating inequalities, but at the same time ask the not-for-profit sector to correct, to correct, uh, to, to repair, let's say, to fix those inequalities by applying the same instruments, the same logic of the free market capitalism. This is a practical, a pragmatic contradiction. You cannot use uh, something to correct something evil uh, and use instruments that generated that evil thing. And uh, after reading the book I mentioned earlier, I uh, congratulated on that uh, with the writer because I think that uh, he was able to understand the situation also of other European countries uh, such as uh, Italy. So to conclude, this is why uh, the, the work by Palotta was very important because it allows us to understand and rationalize things. The purpose we have is the same everywhere. And uh, 
we want, as he does, uh, we want to reduce inequalities, to uh, have equality, find uh, uh, ways to solve rare diseases. You know that rare diseases have no antidotes. Uh, because we lack knowledge? Well, no, not at all. It's just because pharmaceutical uh, labs do not have any interest in putting in the market a product because rare diseases are 5,000, 6,000 maximum, and you make no profit from that. So uh, for several years, I sat uh, in the board of directors of the hospital Bambin Gesù in Rome, which is a not-for-profit hospital, I must say. And I know that uh, there was a, a fundraising activity there, and the purpose was give us the money to fund the research um, for rare, rare diseases. And you know that uh, Bambin Gesù Hospital is the third in Europe uh, and uh, uh, it has very good results also in the world. It wasn't like that in the past. And why this? Because we focused on intrinsic and not extrinsic remuneration. The uh, chief of surgeries were not paid so much, but the best surgeons came to us. And uh, well, we paid less, but we gave them more satisfaction. And that's what I mentioned earlier. I, I, remember, I remember that the director of neurology came to me and told me, I'm going to California for six months uh, to study there. And I asked there, are you happy? Well, yes, sure, but not so much. And why? Because you know, Professor, I have two daughters. One is in middle school, uh, third year, and the other in the first year. Well, my husband is also a doctor. He is very good as a doctor, but he is quite uh, um, stupid in a way because he cannot care for my daughters, if he stays in Rome, I'm not certain that my daughters are safe and uh, have survived when I come back. I, I would even stay there 10 months and take my daughters uh, in California. Then when they go back to Italy, they will have an exam to continue their school. And I will have the chance, the opportunity to follow my children's development. Well, that's good. But, well, you know, the chief of staff told me that uh, they are making efforts because uh, they are paying for everything for six months and they couldn't do more. So what did I do? I called the chief, I talked to him, and I explained the same things that I've been explaining so far, but he still didn't understand. And so I said, well, listen, can you open the window? Why are you hot? No, you open the window and I'll throw you out of the window. And I really criticized him, even if at the end we became very best friends. Because I said, you are a bastard because uh, you are not... Uh, given four months uh, and to, to that uh, uh, lady and you are ruining her family life. At the end, uh, she got two pat patents that improved uh, the uh, life of the hospital. You see, you were stupid because you wanted to save, but actually at the end she gave us something more back. So considering that experience, uh, they asked her, would you go to a different hospital with, where you get more money? Not at all. I want to stay here. And I could tell you a lot of these episodes, a lot of these uh, um, stories. So remuneration is composed of two parts. Uh, the monetary remuneration, that's the salary, and the 
non-material remuneration that comes from the three factors I mentioned earlier. So I know that uh, American people do not understand this or not complete it because their story, their history is different. It started in the 1700s with the Puritans. Uh, they've always had a capitalistic market and not a civil market. And uh, they think that there is no alternative, whereas, whereas there is. But that, what they say is something that works in that context. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, uh, Valerio is good at creating this sort of dialogue between us and the United States because we can learn from that, them, but they can also learn from us. We should be humble and recognize that this is at the basis of a growth. Thank you, thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. Uh, a big round of applause to our second speaker. Can you hear me, Professor Zamani? Okay. Regarding uh, all the other aspects, uh, for example, too many not-for-profits uh, focus on overheads, or, for example, uh, uh, not-for-profits are not allowed to run risks. What about these points? Can we put them into practice in Italy as well? Well, I didn't mention them at the beginning of my speech. There are many aspects in the uncharitable book I agree on. And uh, this is one of those points where Dan is right. If you know me, you know that I have always fought against overheads. I am an economist, and I have to say that those who focus on overheads do not understand anything of economy. They don't know anything about joint production. If I want a flow I need some stock. Try to ask some economists who believe they know economy. Ask them, what's the difference between a stock and a fund? Well, they don't know the answer. They, they think it's the same. So talking about overheads is ridiculous. Sometimes I have to fight with my uh, friends who are accountants, but they can't understand the difference. They don't understand that focusing on overheads is wrong. If you want to get something, you need a stock and a fund. And that fund is called overheads. But if you do not enable resources to get to a fund or a stock, your organization will always be small. You think you can achieve results without overheads. This is crazy, and only idiots can believe that. And when I say idiot, I mean that you are short-sighted. So if you are short-sighted, you just focus on overheads. But as fundraisers, you have to educate your donors. You have to teach them the difference between a stock and a fund. You have to talk to the members of the board. You have to tell them that their mentality is wrong. And it's the result of bad learning. So, Valerio, I agree with you 100%, or, well, I agree with Dan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. I know that uh, Professor Zamani wants to educate us, so he wants us to be good fundraisers, he wants us to educate donors and philanthropists to change their mind. And we spend most of our time with them, so we want them to understand these concepts much better. It's true, it's true, you're right. 
Dan is right on another aspect as well. Depending on your uh, culture and personality, every human being tends to pay attention to other people. This means you tend to look after other people. I am a fundraiser, and if I consider my donor as a source of money, or just a source of money, well, this can be risky, because if I push my donor, at the end of the day, he or she may donate something, but then he or she will stop. That's why fundraisers should be educators, so they shed they should educate uh, both donors and those who create funds. Well, we need to focus on anthropology as well. If you think about Hobbes, homo homini lupus, so according to him, every human being is a wolf and wants to attack other people, where if you agree with Hobbes, you will never accept what I have just said. But this is not true to over everybody. It's true that some people agree with Hobbes, but it's not most of them, and it's not me saying that. Some research was done about that. I don't know if you are familiar with the game of the ultimatum. It's uh, an American game, and according to this game, most of the people, most of the people, do not agree with Hobbes and his statement homo homini lupus. So this means that fundraisers like you should be able to understand whether the donor or the person you're talking to agrees with Hobbes or not. Hobbes was an English um, philosopher. Homo homini natura amicus. This is a different statement. And according to this statement, every human being uh, tends to be friendly to other people. So if you want to get money, never ask money to a person who agrees with Hobbes. But people thinking like Hobbes uh, are a minority. So focus uh, on other people, on most of the people. I know you give classes and courses on fundraising techniques. Uh, Valeria is a master uh, from this point of view. And when you give such courses, you have to teach your students that you can donate as well. So you allow those people to do their best. And at the end of the day, donors will thank you. You all know Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol. Well, some parents have forgotten that story. I still remember a Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens, and the protagonist was a person who agreed with Hobbes, but one day he felt how joyful you can be when you spend some time with children, and on Christmas Eve he decided to give away his wealth and to sing Christmas carols with with children. And the protagonist said, this is what I really wanted to become in my life. Well, okay, this is a novel, but Charles Dickens was uh, a special writer. He was born in the 20th century. So you feel more joyful when you donate rather than receiving gifts or money or something. These uh, statement, this concept can be found in uh, the Bible as well. I'm a Roman Catholic, I respect all the other religions, but I would 
uh, like uh, the mutuality principle to be respected. So if I respect you, you should do the same. And if you feel more joyful when you donate rather than when you receive something, your donors will thank you. Your donors will worry about their funds and they will care for their funds and where they end up. That's why it's very important to evaluate the impact of your association in the world. But before that, it's very important for the person to feel appreciated when they make a donation. Think about San Francis. San Francis is the most popular saint in the world, and even atheist people uh, know San Francis. San Francis was a unique person, and before becoming a religious person, he was an entrepreneur and he told his uh, servants to distribute clothes to the poor people. And he didn't do it in the first person because poor people were smelly. But then he changed his mind and he went to um, leper people and uh, he gave some food to those people. So he built a relationship with these people. So before he was a philanthropist, but then when he became religious, he decided to uh, consider the principle of giving as a way to build a relationship with the poor people. In the past, he made donations or used to make donations because he was like a Puritan, but then he felt uh, how joyful you can be when you donate something. And that's why he said, uh, what uh, felt like something bitter, it's now a joy for my soul and my mind. You know that St. Francis did so many things and we should do the same. Well, but religion does not play any role in this case. I just mentioned St. Francis as an historical character. I'm not saying that you should be as religious as St. Francis. We should do the same with, with our donors. And when you act like that with your donors, remember that donations will increase. So there is a lot of work to do in a country like Italy. We used to have deep roots and we have destroyed them because the government has intervened too much and many people do not accept that, but that's the truth. So we have to go back to our roots. And when this happens, Everybody, donors, fundraisers, philanthropists, they realize they can um, build a civil friendship or a social friendship. This means that hatred or barriers disappear. You, you are together in uh, taking uh, uh, the same action. So, to conclude, our well-being depends on four categories of goods. You have private goods, public goods, relational goods, and common goods. Common goods or commons. A typical example of commons is the environment, or water, or air. What's the point? Unfortunately, according to the American economic tradition, uh, up to 20 years ago, people thought that well-being only depended on public and private goods. But it's not like that. Relational goods are essential. Think about a person dying in a hospital. What can you bring to this person? Are you going to bring him or her uh, a cake? No. That person wants to be cheered up. And this is an example of relational goods. And what kind of price or value can you assign to this relational good? It's a something intangible. That's why the for-profit sector 
will never offer relational goods. And it's not up to the third sector to do that. The third sector provides um, private and public goods. But the for-profit sector cannot provide relational goods. And the magic of the not-for-profit sector is to provide common and relational goods that nor the state or uh, the capitalist market can offer. Think about assistance, think about taking care of disabled people, or think about uh, our social cooperatives or enterprises and what they do for sick or disabled people. If you are a disabled person, I am sure you will feel happy if you are allowed the opportunity to do a job and work. That's why the real mission of the not-for-profit sector is to give its contribution to fight against poverty, but it's not like that. It should contribute to increase the importance of relational goods. And what does it mean? This means that we need to shift from um, a model where you have just a state and the market to a model where you have the market, the state, and the community. And uh, in the past, the concept of community in the USA was really present, but after the Second World War, things changed, and American people are still paying consequences for that. In a month, the UN is going to publish the annual report on um, the index of happiness, so the happiness report in every country. And have a look uh, at the ranking, uh, pay attention to this ranking, and it's the UN that will publish the happiness report. The US is uh, the country with the highest per capita income in the world, but uh, the uh, happiness index is one of the lowest. And why is the suicide rate so high in the US? You should read a book by Deaton. Deaton is uh, uh, an economy Nobel Prize, and he published his last book last year, Death of Despair. This is the title of his last book. And uh, I have to say, uh, it's a terrible book. People committing a suicide are not poor people. Poor people never commit a suicide because they hope the future will be better than their present. People committing a suicide are wealthy people, but these people feel hopeless. That's why the title of the book is Death of Despair. The book by Deason is becoming more and more popular and uh, the average age of people committing a suicide is very low. So in the US, uh, the suicide rate is very high and people committing a suicide are managers uh, or top executives. Uh, and the question is why? Well, the answer is the following, because American people have never paid attention to relational goods. If you find relational goods in the index of uh, an American book on economy, well, I, I will have to give you a prize. So in the US, there are many foundations, organizations whose mission is to offer what the state and the market cannot provide. And uh, when you explain that concept, you achieve a great result. Last year, in June, the Italian Constitutional Court issued uh, a revolutionary verdict, let's say. And it's the 131 verdict. You can download it from uh, the website of the Constitutional Court. And this happened in June 2020. According to this uh, verdict, verdict, the not-for-profit uh, 
organizations have the same identity, constitutional identity, as the one of four profit organizations and state organizations. So, as you can see, this statement has been revolutionary. It takes a long time sometimes, but we can get to our goal. And uh, because of the pandemic, we also have to rethink our laws. The not-for-profit sector is submitted to the for-profit sector, and we cannot justify that. The Constitutional Court has changed the history, and you can download these five pages from the website of the Constitutional Court. So read these decision made by the Constitutional Court, and once you do it, you can realize what fundraisers can do. It's about um, working on projects together. And if you want to cooperate, you have to hire talented people in the third sector as well. And the exactia question of overheads needs to stop. We cannot accept that. And the same is true for uh, those tenders where only those who offer the lowest prices win. This is a crime against humanity. And uh, if you don't believe in what uh, I'm saying, the a minister of economy in France in 1694 wrote a document and he sent this document to the king where he told him, uh, Your Majesty, you have to abolish tenders where only people who offer the lowest prices win. These tenders will destroy our countries, and this happened at the end of the 17th century. Nowadays in Italy, there are still people in favor of tenders where only those who offer low prices win. Well, I think such actions damage you as fundraisers. It's because of such tenders that you have to cut down on overheads. So if you have some capital, okay, you can survive, but otherwise your organization will disappear. But I'm sure we will get to a solution. I am optimistic, and I'm sure that very soon even our landscape will change. That's why initiatives like uh, the, the one we're taking part in today are very important. They're more important than what we think. Thanks to these initiatives, we can be aware of a transition that is taking place. It started a um, few months ago, but it will help us see our target. Thank you. Thank you very much. So you are free to give many rounds of applause to our professor. So thank you and thank you very much for sharing your ideas with us. Everyone should be connected, but first of all, I would like to thank Illumnia. Illumnia is the company hosting Professor Zamani right now. Professor Zamani had some technical problems at home but it's not true my connection worked fine uh, in my place well last time we were there we had some technical problems that's why we asked Illumia to host you so thank you very much thank you Illumia very well so you can see uh, Dan and uh, Stefano connected hi Dan welcome back Thank you. It was uh, wonderful to listen to the professor. Nice to meet you. And Giancarla Pancione from Save the Children is with us together with Niccolò Contucci from the Italian Association uh, that works against breast cancer, then Alessandro Betti from Teleton and Valentina Mellis from Il Sole 24 Ore. So, Dan, if you want to make a comment on what Professor Zamani said, you're free to make it. 
Well, the professor covered a lot of different points, too, too many for me to address in a, in a, in a brief statement. But I, the thing I would take issue with most is Stefano seems to be saying, well, Dan doesn't understand Italy. Dan only understands America. Well, first of all, <laughs> I come from Italian people, so I understand Italy. I talk with my hands, right? But also, I've spoken all over the world. In, in countries where the philanthropic sector is not very well developed, I've spoken in Russia, I've spoken in, in Mexico, um, I've spoken in New Zealand where it's smaller, and, and, and many, many other countries. And I would say the world over, everywhere in the world, the nonprofit sector faces the same issues of donor misunderstanding about how the sector works. The professor says, well, Italy is different, but does Italy not have poverty? Does Italy not have suicide? Does Italy not have homelessness? Does Italy not have problems that it has been unable to fully solve? Yes. And do we want to solve those problems? Yes. Has the system we have been using solved those problems? No. And to me, the professor seems to be saying this, the system that we have is just fine. Let's not change it too much. But that system is incapable of solving problems. So we need to think in new ways about this. Also, I think he says, you know, that the Italian religious tradition is different than the Puritans. Well, I wasn't raised a Puritan. I was raised a Roman Catholic. <laughs> and I was taught by the nuns at a very young age that I was born with original sin, you know. Um, so it's, it's identical to what the Puritans taught. And also the professor talks about the warm glow, right? It's the warm glow that it's the intrinsic compensation in the nonprofit sector that is everything that matters. And you'll recall I didn't use those terms, but there's a warm glow at Apple. Do you think the young uh, computer coder who develops applications for the blind at Apple doesn't feel a warm glow? My dad has prostate cancer, and um, he's been able to survive almost eight years now on the drugs that for-profit pharmaceutical companies have produced. Do we not think the people who develop those drugs in a for-profit setting feel the warm glow of knowing that they've helped grandfathers live longer? So uh, while I, so I, think, I think the professor and I are actually in agreement on a lot of fronts, but my, my main point to the audience would be, I don't think you should settle for the notion that just keep things as they are. I don't think you should settle for the notion that the nonprofit sector is weak in Italy and always will be. I think you can strengthen the nonprofit sector in Italy. We need to strengthen the nonprofit sector in the United States. We have a right to dream. And if the professor is saying that, that we have a right to dream, then we're in agreement. If the professor is saying that dreams are dangerous, then we're not in agreement. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Well, the challenge has started. So now the floor goes uh, to all the other guests as if we were in a talk show. So raise your hand or feel free to make any comments. Uh, please, please make brief and short comments and try to speak slowly so that... Uh, uh, our interpreters uh, can work better. So, who is going to raise uh, his or hand first? Oh, Giancarla. Well, first of all, I would like to thank Dan. Thank you, Dan, because you inspired us. 
In Italy, we need someone inspirational like you are, and uh, we feel much more energized. So thank you very much. I took some notes. You're welcome. Thank you. And uh, when you... I... I would like to recall what you said about going to the moon. I firmly believe that focusing on overheads is ruining the not-for-profit sector, and this is true both in Italy and the USA. I work for Save the Children, so I know how things work. Unfortunately, you said it's very important to educate donors. So while educating donors, you need to realize that this action takes time. So in the meantime, we also need to develop another strategy. And in our case, I think it's a cultural problem because it's not just a matter of donors or boards Part of not-for-profit associations believe it's unethical to invest money in marketing or compensation for fundraisers. So, to conclude, I would like uh, to hear your advice on how to be disruptive and innovative. How can we change this culture in Italy? I would like your piece of advice. What should we do? And finally, uh, Italy is not uh, a world apart, let's say. So the principles you mentioned you found in Russia or in England uh, are present in Italy as well. So thank you. Dan, the floor to you. Yes, you know, I'll, I'll repeat what I said earlier. Um, how, do you, how do you change the culture in Italy? It's difficult work, right? It's hard work. It's labor. And you have to be persistent and you have to be consistent. You have to continue to educate and to educate and to educate. And you can draw inspiration from many movements. Um, you know, there was a time, not long ago at all, and still in some places, where it was considered immoral and unethical for um, two men to be together or two women to be together. It was gay marriage was considered unethical. Um, now, slowly, the world is beginning to accept it. It was considered in the United States in the 1950s and 60s and even the 1970s immoral for a black man to marry a white woman or for a black woman to marry a white man. Now, it took a lot of time to change those attitudes. Those attitudes didn't change overnight. But brave people drew a line in the sand and said, this we must change. And... There's no easier answer than that. How do you change the culture? You have to make it a goal to change the culture. You have to stop believing that you cannot change the culture. <clears throat> because for too long in the nonprofit sector, we have been told this is the way donors think. This is the way donors have always thought. This is the way donors always will think. You cannot change it. That's what we've been told. Well, now we're beginning to see, just beginning to see, we can change the way donors think. It's going to be hard work. It's going to be a long road, but we must walk that road. And in my own life, in the last 10 years since I've been doing this, I've seen enormous changes in the way certain people in the United States think about these things. People I thought their minds I could never change. The watchdog agencies that monitor overhead ratios. You know, after I gave my TED talk, they came out with a press release and they told the public you should not ask about overhead anymore. I couldn't believe my ears. Last week, the biggest watchdog in the United States asked me if I would write a blog for their website about why donors should not ask about salaries. 
Now that's a huge change. So we're making, we're making progress. In every audience I speak to, I see minds that are willing to be changed. You just have to, you have to work at it and work at it. And you need some tools, right? You need some tools, which is why I mentioned like the TED Talk is a good place to start because it's translated. Um, and, and maybe we can translate some of my other materials. You definitely need tools. You know, you, 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 you need literature and, and, and powerful tools that can change people's minds. Maybe when my documentary comes out in September, we will definitely subtitle that in Italian. That'll be a 90-minute movie that can, that can change the way people think. You could, you know, show that all over the country. But um, there's no one magic answer. It's labor. It's work. It takes time. And it is time for us to begin that work. Well, Dan, maybe we could uh, make a, a Netflix TV series, a sort of Game of Thrones on philanthropy. What do you think about it? <clears throat> yes, um, I don't know about Game of Thrones. <laughs> That's pretty violent, but <laughs> we can kill people who won't, <laughs> who won't ask different questions. But um, there's, a, there's a show in the U.S., there's a show in the U.S. called Shark Tank. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, where people come on with their business ideas. And there are four investors. And, they, and, and, the, and the person gives their business ideas and gives the investors a chance. And so we've been talking about starting a show like that in the United States, where there are four, there's a charity that comes on, and they tell their idea. And there are four experts who help them think about it differently and in the process of watching the show, the viewers will see, oh, they're telling me to think about this in a different way. So I think television and, and, and the same media that consumer brands use, I think it's important for us to have a presence in that kind of media. And a television show is a brilliant idea. Well, for those of you who are following this live, remember that at 6 p.m. you can stay connected and you can take part in the speed networking event. So you can meet uh, other thousands of people who are now connected. So don't disconnect at 6 p.m. because of the platform will be open if you're interested in meeting other people and do some networking. So it's very nice to um, listen and to talk about many different things. Nicolo, Alessandro or Valentina and Professor Zamani, if you want to say something, just raise your hand. Great. So, Nicolò, Alessandro or Valentina, who wants to take the floor? Unfortunately, we can't hear you, Nicolò. Ale Alessandro. Alessandro has raised his hand. Alessandro has raised his hand. Allora, avevo una domanda... I have a question and I have a comment for Professor Zamagni. You mentioned intrinsic and extrinsic motivations, especially when talking about professionals or individuals coming closer to the not-for-profit or the for-profit sectors. Uh, people have uh, different uh, views on uh, uh, their profession, they have different outlooks on lives. Uh, that's why you have uh, thousands of intrinsic or, or extrinsic motivations. My question is, if it's true we cannot take care of overheads too much because uh, the for-profit models have to be applied to the not-for-profit sector. So why is the human factor the only factor you should take into account? Think about the fundraiser, a professional who studied a lot in order to do his or her best for the cause. So why a productive factor should prevent 
people from fulfilling their intrinsic or extrinsic motivations, especially if these can um, benefit the cause, the donors, and the organization. So, uh, please make a summary of the question or the comment made by Alessandro, because I couldn't hear Alessandro. What do you mean? Well, he was talking Italian, so I couldn't uh, hear Alessandro speaking Italian. Well, Alessandro Betti, the director of Teleton, said that you, professor, mentioned intrinsic and ex extrinsic motivations. There are many important factors when creating wealth in a company, so why should we constrain human resources, whereas uh, other uh, factors are free of constraints. For example, you said that uh, at the hospital, Bambin Gesù, uh, compensation was lower than the average because professionals had an intrinsic motivation. And why? Why did you do that? Could you explain this concept a bit better? Well, the problem uh, is not ideology. Psychologists, uh, experts uh, uh, can confirm that we are not all the same. There are people who are spurred by intrinsic motivations and some others who are spurred by extrinsic motivations. If you are inspired by an intrinsic motivation, it means that Probably extrinsic motivation is still important, but uh, your intrinsic motivation is more important. Um, biodiversity is a fact. Not every plant is the same as all the other plants, and we cannot say that a group of human beings is better than another group. We are all different from each other, and uh, we cannot have the same model for everybody. This is unacceptable. This kills freedom, so we have to pay attention to that. We, we cannot believe in isomorphism. This means we can't have one shape fitting everybody. If you believe in freedom, you should let people free to decide and to follow their motivation. If you say, oh, okay, I just work to earn a lot of money, okay, in that case, ideology is not important. My daughter is a doctor, she's a great researcher, she's a professor, and when I asked her, why, why are you working as a researcher, she answered, I'm, I don't work for money, but a colleague of hers admitted that he's doing that to earn a lot of money. And that's okay, and that's okay, I accept that. But what I'm saying is that you should give everybody the opportunity to fulfill their human potential. In my opinion, it's very dangerous to try to impose the same mentality or the same model to everybody. Countries have a different culture. Why should I impose a, a strategy or a model to Italy that doesn't fit with uh, its culture? This is called dictatorship, in my opinion. We should try to understand the characteristics of every country, and we should make the most of them. It's true that nothing is perfect, and we can solve our problems, but the way to solve problems is not just one. And uh, recent studies all agree on the idea that 
um, according to cultural imperialism, um, if one country has been successful in one area, then that model should be applied to all the other countries. But this is not true. This is very dangerous, and recent studies have proved that. Well, Dan said that in Italy uh, the, the system works, but actually it's not true. I said the opposite. I don't understand how he could understand the opposite. I said that in Italy things changed when in the Second World War happened what happened, and I'm not going to repeat that. I'm not happy or satisfied with the current situation. What I wanted to say is that the way out of a specific problem is not the same as the one suggested by Dan when talking about the US. The American um, way out uh, is a disaster in Italy. And in the future, we will see who is right if Dan or me is right. I cannot impose a, a specific model to a community with a different culture or a different strategy. I cannot impose a model developed for another country to Italy or another country. We continue to talk about ethics, but we can't continue to talk about ethics. In the US, um, utilitarian, utilitarianism is quite popular. Well, maybe Dan doesn't know that. He should probably study utilitarianism. It's the basis of American culture, and there's nothing wrong with it, but you should be aware of that. And uh, in Italy, uh, the ethics, the common ethics, is the one of Aristotle. So what kind of metrics are you referring to? The American one, the Italian one, or etc.? Regarding the not-for-profit sector, utilitarianism doesn't go hand in hand with the code of ethics. So the world of virtue is the favorite one in Italian, in the Italian third sector, and I'm not the only one saying that. So if you spoke to people, people would tell you what I have just explained to you. We should get used to accepting that there is a cultural biodiversity. And that's okay, because if we are all the same, well, this is a disaster. It's through diversity if we can, uh, we can improve or succeed only if we are different from each other. So diversity is a resource. And we should progress basing on a strategy or a model that is perfectly in line with the culture of our country. Dan is right when he says you can change your culture. Yes, that's true. But when you say you can change your culture, the question is, which direction are you going to follow? Are you going to abandon your status quo? Are you going to uh, follow the Eastern or the Western path? Well, that depends on the institutional uh, setting of your country. We have to open up to dialogue, that's okay, but the dialogue should take place on an equal footing. You shouldn't impose a model that works in your country to another country. In the US, Dan's proposal works well, it's true. I'm not saying this is not true, but I would like to be treated on an equal footing. I don't like people whose attitude is the following, this is the line you should follow. I don't like that. And if you don't believe in that, I would like to have enough money to organize a referendum and to speak to people. I speak to people, I work with people, I stay with them, so I know how they feel, I know what they think, and I know how they take on board some concepts. 
I have been retired for eight years and I still continue to give classes like the ones at the John Hopkins University and I do that for free. Well, according to Palotta, I'm probably a stupid person because I am retired, but I'm still working for free. I'm giving classes for free and I have hundreds of students. Have a look at their evaluation on my courses. They're pretty happy to stay with me. So am I stupid because I'm, I'm continuing to give classes for free? Well, I'm sorry, I don't agree with that. So, you have to be careful when saying that. I think my message is clear enough. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nicolo, the floor to you. So, please, please, brief comments or brief questions because we want to hear a lot of questions from you. So, even Dan, Stefano Zamani, please, please try to make very brief comments. Thank you, thank you, Valerio. I was very happy listening to both uh, Professor Damani and Dan Pallotta. But, um, well, I cannot uh, uh, deny my Italian cultural origins. And after working 30 years in the not-for-profit sector in Italy, I think that there are more contradictions in what Professor Zamani is saying than uh, in what Dan Palotta has said. And um, I'm saying this, uh, um, I want to explain this for those who are listening, um, because Professor Zamani has uh, concluded talking about freedom. So considering that uh, I need to focus on just one topic and I do not have enough time to talk about other things, I would like to talk about the remuneration, the compensation uh, in the not-for-profit sector. I think that Italy is the only place in the world in which a uh, threshold, a maximum limit uh, uh, for the salaries in the not-for-profit sector was imposed, or it was uh, uh, set by the government. Professor Damani uh, did something revolutionary in 1997 because uh, he promoted the law that created the onlus. So it's the charitable association which is typical of Italy. And there was a new rule, a new regulation introduced and said that if you wanted to be uh, on loose, so a charity, well, employees shouldn't uh, earn more than 20% of what set at the uh, state level for other works. But the organization could decide whether to be a charity, an onlus, an onlus or uh, a different kind of association. This is something which is negative and uh, has no justification, in my opinion. And it's the reason why, recently, the uh, code uh, of the not-for-profit sector um, said that uh, all the associations of the not-for-profit sectors are not um, limited anymore, or better, they are limited uh, in a way that they set a maximum of 40% of the salary compared to other uh, professions. So how can we talk about freedom in a place, in a country like Italy, where those working in the not-for-profit sectors have seen their uh, rights uh, violated in terms of salary because the government set a limit that should not be um, overcome. 
Well, if uh, we think of donors, as uh, Dan was saying earlier, we do not only uh, should uh, tell donors this and to tell them that there is a law establishing uh, the, the money that uh, people get in the not-for-profit sector, but we should also underline that uh, this law was introduced together with another law talking about the indirect distribution of profits. So if someone decided to pay more an employee because uh, mm, they deserve more because they are, I don't know, programmer or a control manage, manager. And if they pay more for an employee, there is uh, an unfair distribution of profits. Uh, moreover, Professor Zamani referred to the history of economy. And um, we were taught that uh, the work is remunerated by a salary and capital is remunerated by profit. But how can you confuse in a law such as the one we have the profit made by someone with the salary that is given to a person. So freedom here should mean that if an employee is strongly motivated, has an intrinsic motivation and wants to have that job and that role, that person will be let's say, content with a lower salary, but there shouldn't be a law providing for that. And what Dan was saying is right. The most qualified people, the most competent people, and Professor Zamani also talked about co-planning, as stated by Article 55 uh, of the law for the not-for-profit sector, um, well, it said that uh, the result at the end in Italy is that uh, we might hire uh, people that are very good people with lower salaries, but we'll never be able to do something better. So my question to both of you is, is it acceptable that a state, a government, set for the salaries of a whole sector of private economy, which is the social private economy? Well, if you agree, I would give the floor to Dan before, because uh, I think that uh, he can uh, also answer to the previous questions. And if you want, you can answer the question by Nicolo about the salary and the government. And then I will sum up very briefly the question for Professor Zamani. And I think that he cannot uh, <coughs> hear. Dan, the floor is yours. Yeah, you know, Stefano wants to draw these big distinctions between the United States and Italy, and I don't think the differences are that great. And um, to this question, he, he says Dan's ideas may work well in the United States. Well, people are, are as against my ideas in the United States as they are in Italy. This is a new way of thinking, and people don't like new ways of thinking anywhere in the world, doesn't matter whether you're in Italy or Mexico or the United States. In New York, Governor Cuomo set um, limits on the amount of money that you could compensate an executive director of a charity in New York if you were receiving state funds. So the exact same problem that, um, is, it, is it Alessandro or who, who just spoke? 
Niccolo just just stated. So we have we have the exact same problem, and we've been fighting against it. But he he. So we are not the only one in the world. He, we are not, not the, the only, only one. one. <clears throat> You're not the only one. But the point the point he made the point he made about freedom is critical. Stefano says that he lectures for free, and I must think he's stupid. I lecture for free. I'm 10 miles away from Harvard University. Every once in a while I go over to Harvard University, I, I do it for free. That doesn't mean I have a right to say everybody else should do their work for free just because I'm doing something for free. Stefano says you can't have one shape for everyone. That's a dictatorship, he says. Yet that's exactly what he wants. He wants one shape for everyone. No one in the nonprofit sector should make very much money. And he wants to be a dictator with that. And that's something that should be up to the individual person. That's not something that one person should unilaterally dictate. He's saying there should be a different shape for everyone, yet he wants the same shape for every person. And this is the problem, this old way of thinking <clears throat> that um, money contaminates people's motives, right? Really? Huh. Bruce Springsteen makes hundreds of millions of dollars, and he still seems like he wants to make great music. The money hasn't contaminated his desire to make great music. You know, David Hockney, the American modern artist, makes millions and millions of dollars. Lady Gaga, millions of dollars, and she still wants to produce great music. You know, football quarter quarterbacks, baseball players, they're played millions of dollars but they still seem like they want to win the baseball game. Show me where money is contaminating their motives. Why do we think if we compensate someone in the nonprofit sector, give them more money so they can send their kids to the kind of school they want to send their kids to, so they can take care of their parents in their old age, that all of a sudden they will stop caring about the cause. These are old ideas and they are no longer serving us. Professor Dan's answer, uh, well, could you hear what he said? Yes, 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 I listened to him. But I think he didn't really understand what I meant, but uh, the, the, the fault is mine. I think that he misunderstood my ideas, but I think that this is um, uh, my fault because I think that I said the opposite of what he said. I asked for pluralism, whereas he said that I want a uniqueness. Um, he mentioned freedom, but maybe he does not know what positive freedom is. Um, Dan, I think you should, well, you know, study a bit more, study the books, uh, the books uh, of uh, American writers and not the Italian ones. Maybe the last one by Michael Sandel that uh, was published uh, uh, a little time ago and uh, study a bit more about that, about the positions, because I think you lack uh, the knowledge uh, and you make some mistakes. When you said that philanthropy comes from Latin, well, it's not like that, it's a Greek word. You, you need to know what you don't know and not just mm, want to go and teach other people, because I think this is not acceptable. It violates the uh, justice uh, criteria. If a professor wants to teach something, well, they need to study before. Those who do not study give bad lectures and students are, um, let's say, disadvantaged. They do not get the right advantage. And that's uh, an elementary rule uh, which has always been existing. There cannot be exceptions to the rules. Whereas, um, well, uh, I well, couldn't you're hear... Not making, uh, you're not making an argument here. Now you're trying to make a personal attack. You're not actually making an argument. Well, that's uh, a challenge, I think, an open challenge. Uh, and. Uh, uh, well, uh, I've read plenty of I've read plenty of book I've read plenty of books. I attended Harvard University. 
And maybe you should spend some time in the field raising $600 million the way that I did. Okay. Can you sum up now the question of Nicolò, please? Well, the question asked by Nicolò is in line with what Dan Pallara was saying in his answer. It's extremely simple. And is it possible that a government, a state, uh, defines uh, the salary of a person working in the not-for-profit sector. Don't you think it is an injustice? For example, there is a law in Italy saying that an employee cannot get uh, more than 20%, uh, could not get more than 20% in the past, uh, and now it is 40%. Don't you think that this is a non-democratic uh, um, action, a lack of freedom? Well, I totally agree with that. I totally agree with that because uh, a government should not do it, should not um, set this. And it's one of the consequences of statalism, according to which uh, a state, a government, should define the criteria of acceptable behaviors. So I totally agree with what, with what Nicola was saying. But we should wonder why. And uh, I said this in my presentation. That's the consequence of what happened after the welfare state and after the start of the welfare state. And uh, we are leaving it behind uh, very slowly, and I would prefer to do it quickly, actually. But we need to know, and that was the interest, if that was the interest of Nicolò, I agree with him. You cannot have that kind of limits uh, with no um, legitimate reasons at the basis uh, and no um, other things. So then, thank you, you are a very welcomed West guest. Uh, I want to underline this. Uh, uh, we are extremely uh, honored to have you here. So feel free to take the floor whenever you want and say what you want to say. We are here to listen to you. Now, Valentina, do you have a question? Well, I have a question for Dan Pallotta. Dan, this is Valentina Melis. I don't know uh, if you heard about her. She's a journalist of Il Sole 24 Ore, an Italian financial times, let's say. It's like the Financial Times. It's a very, very important newspaper in Italy. I don't know how many readers there are, but I think it ranks second or third in Italy. Uh, because actually in Italy there are a lot of rules, plenty, plenty of rules and laws, and Il Sole 24 Ore is uh, the one uh, explaining them making them clear. Thank you, Valerio. Thank you, Valerio, for your introduction. Uh, I wanted to ask this to Dan. Talking about overhead, he referred to the fact that no one in a store uh, buying shoes or a mobile phone would ask what kind of overhead expenses there were. But don't you think there is a difference between risk capital uh, used by businesses and the money of donors, uh, the money of donors uh, or what we call cinque per mille, which is what is given to the not-for-profit sector with the uh, tax uh, um, revenues of uh, taxpayers. And the second thing is there's a charity called Pane Quotidiano and uh, after uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, this organization distributing food has seen uh, the number of beneficiaries increasing a lot. Uh, so those who manage this organization, well, if they were free to uh, give salaries and remuneration, uh, what would uh, they do? Would they... Uh, I don't know, show off uh, what they have, their wealth uh, to these poor people. And in Italy, there are lots of employees and lots of volunteers. If the 
decision makers, let's say the boards uh, of the not-for-profit sector were prayed, as in the profit sectors, would volunteers offer their time uh, uh, in the same way? What do you think? Well, there are people being paid a lot of money as the CEOs of... Uh, yes, uh, then you can answer. I will sum up the question for Professor Zamani later. Yeah, there are CEOs of... Uh, there are presidents of nonprofit organizations all over the world who are paid good salaries and, and volunteers still volunteer. Volunteers get an intrinsic value out of that. That's not... And, and volunteers may have their own work where they get paid very well at the same time. Um, and I do think, you know, if, if, if you can't just go pay someone a high salary because even if they're a great person and expect that donors aren't going to be angry. So this is why we need to change the way donors think so that they understand we're trying to hire for value here so that we can produce a bigger result. We're trying to forward the mission by hiring this person. But until you, you educate donors about that, you could get into a lot of trouble by just doing it with their current attitude. When you buy on your overhead question, the nonprofits are at a disadvantage because when you buy an iPhone, right, the, the minute you hold it in your hand, you know everything about that iPhone. You know how it works. Oh, I like this. I like that. I like this. It's different when you donate to a charity. You don't know what's happening with the money. This is why we ask about overhead, because we think, well, if I ask about overhead, that will tell me what's happening with the money. But it doesn't. You want to ask a different set of questions. <clears throat> you want to ask, um, what are your goals? What progress are you making toward those goals? And how do you improve? Those are the questions that um, we should encourage uh, donors to ask. And I also wanted to say that um, Stefano said that I should read more. <laughs> well, I've done plenty of reading. The fact that we haven't read the same books, Stefano, doesn't mean that we aren't equally educated. Um, I think that you should spend more time doing fundraising when you've gone out and raised 600 million dollars by creating your own company and having 400 employees and having 200,000 participants and having Harvard Business School study it then maybe you can tell me a thing or two about fundraising I think uh, for sure there are uh, nuances and uh, different things uh, and really thank you, thank you for being available and willing to have this chat and this debate. We have time for another four questions. If the guests want to ask another question, um, Giancarlo Pancione by IRC, uh, from IRC uh, um, and the others. If you want to ask questions, just raise your hand. Uh, please be sure to ask short questions because there are five minutes left and then we need to stop. Okay, Alessandro, a short question. A short question for Dan. And I would like to really thank him for being so inspiring for me that I come from the for-profit world and I found uh, his words very important. The question is, you talked about educating donors, but at the end of the day, shouldn't we be talking more about uh, educating also the uh, not-for-profit sector in respecting the impact. I mean, if we were able to talk about the impact we have in our causes, I don't think we 
also uh, needed to talk about salaries and overhead. If my charity says that I can solve the problem of rare diseases and I can offer therapies that really help beneficiaries, well, I think uh, I reached my goal, the reason why I asked money to a donor. So side by side, there are education for donors, but also education for the charities and educate them to tell precisely the impact. Don't you think that this is also very uh, courageous, very brave, because very often cha charities do not have the impact they want? Well. I would like to uh, sum up uh, a little bit the question for Professor Damani as well. The question is, on one side, we need to educate donors, but shouldn't we also educate charities to tell their causes and imp impact in a different way uh, so that uh, they are told differently? Then the floor is yours. Yes, uh, Alessandro, I agree with you 100%. And, and a lot of my work is directly with nonprofit organizations, telling them you have to start talking about the impact that you're having in the world. You have to start talking to your donors about your dream. If you have a dream that's big enough, they will give you all kinds of permission to spend on salaries and to spend on overhead. But there's got to be some reason. You know, I have a friend who created an organization called Charity Water here in the United States. And um, they raise about oh, $100 million a year now using the tools of capitalism. And he gets a group of people to give him $20 million a year just for overhead. And the reason they do that is because his dream is so big, because he has this dream of bringing clean water to the entire world. And his donors say, if that's your dream, I don't care, I don't care who you have to hire. I don't care what you have to spend on money. If that's what, what, on salaries, if that's what you're really dreaming about, I'm with you, I'm behind you 100%. So I agree with you totally that charities have to start to talk more about the impact they want to have. You, you can't go to a donor and say, just give me more money for overhead because overhead's important. You, you know, like the donor wants to know what's it going to achieve in the world, right? What impact is it going to have? You're absolutely right. That's the important thing. Stop focusing on percentages and money and start focusing on what your dream is. And, and you know, Maybe people are different in Italy than they are in America, but I don't think Italians do not dream. You know, I think, I think Italians have dreams as much as Americans have dreams. And I think pe Italians who work in the nonprofit sector, they have dreams as well. So we're not as different as some people want to say that we are. Thank you, Dan, thank you. <laughs> Well, I totally agree with what uh, Alessandro was saying and the question he asked uh, was right and maybe he wanted to make me happy because those who know me, uh, well, also know that I've been fighting for several years to improve the culture of the charities and uh, um, Alessandro knows that I was one of the first Italians to support the impact assessment, the social impact assessment, um, which uh, uh, was, is something that I really um, put forward a few years ago with some metrics to measure the impact. So I totally agree with you, Alessandro. The problem comes from, from the fact that uh, in our world, in the not-for-profit world, there are people, and I uh, think that these people do it for uh, good reasons, but they think that it shouldn't be like this. Uh, 
Well, I think that I will be successful in fundraising when I able to show the social impact uh, of the things that I'm funding. And impact means change. Some people do not know it. I need to show what kind of change um, I can make in the reality I'm in. If I show this impact, the donor <laughs> is much more willing to maybe donate more, but to do this, you need to study and study and study. This does not mean to um, succeed in an exam, uh, but uh, otherwise you risk uh, to um, have misunderstandings, you know? And so Valerio knows that uh, at the University of Bologna, I created the first degree course, a five-year degree, not a master degree, uh, about organizations. And uh, I hoped that other Italian universities did the same, but this didn't happen. I had the good news recently that the University of Padua, starting from next September, well, that there will be a degree course which is uh, similar to the one in Bologna about the juridical aspects uh, of the not-for-profit sectors. And uh, these topics, the topics we have been dealing with today, uh, will be at the center of it. So make contact with the coordinator to um, introduce this kind of things uh, in the student's program because that's fundamental. So, Alessandro, I agree with you. Giancarla Valentina, would you like to say something to conclude? Giancarla. Well, yes, it's not a question. It's just a final remark. Professor Zamani was talking about the impact, and I totally agree with Alessandro about what he said about the impact to raise more money. But uh, Professor Zamani mm, talked about fundraisers and uh, fundraising several times. And I would like to underline the professional side of this job because you need to have the skills and competences uh, to be a fundraiser. It's a different job, uh, uh, for sure. We need to talk about the not for profit world and whatever is, uh, whatever comes with it. But we need to um, also underline that being a fundraiser is something different, something specific. You need to have skills. And we need to give a message to young people listening to us today. A fundraiser must have the skills and competences needed. And these skills must be paid, must be remunerated. And so uh, these because this comes with responsibilities. And considering that you teach at the master fundraising, you know what it means. Uh, thank you, Giancarla from Ch Save the Children. Valentina, a final remark? We want to add anything? Yes, I would like to say goodbye to everyone. Let's hope that this year the law will bring some new things uh, for the not-for-profit sector in Italy as well. Dan, before saying goodbye, would you like to say something, a final remark, uh, something for Italian people? Would you like to sing to Scendi dalle stelle in Italian? Would you like to sing it? <laughs> No. <laughs> um, I just want to say thank you, Valerio. Thank you to everyone on the panel. Thank you, Stefano. And to everyone that's watching, um, don't let go of your dreams. Don't tell anyone that you're not entitled to dream. You have a right to dream your greatest dreams of making the world a better place, and you have a right to all of the tools you need to make those dreams come true. Thank you, thank you very much. It was wonderful to meet you in your Boston place. Uh, thank you once again, and see you soon. Bye, bye to everyone, thank you. Thank you also to Professor Zamani, to all our guests.
Uh, we are about to conclude. Uh, let's see if there are some take-home uh, take messages and lessons. Uh, um, well, we mentioned at the beginning 10 excuses in the not-for-profit world, 10 excuses um, that Stefano mentioned. Uh, these are the 10 excuses that are, well, the most common. We've always done like this. We can say we cannot want uh, things to change if you continue to do the same things. The second excuse, everything is wonderful, but we are only few. But also big organizations were just uh, made of one person at the beginning. The third, the third excuse, we don't have enough time, but time can be freed. Uh, you can free up time uh, to make important things. We have time to study, to uh, also give the opportunity to educate uh, also as well. Number four, we don't have the money. Well, start doing fundraising and do it well. Number five, uh, we have never done it. Well, so think out of the box and get out of the box and move. Number six, uh, Profits uh, in the for-profit world, it works, but not in the not-for-profit. But what's the difference? There can be a difference, but there are also similarities. Number seven. Where are the other the three remaining excuses? Okay, number seven, we are just volunteers, but being a volunteer is a job. Start thinking of you as professionals and not just uh, someone doing a hobby. Um, let's wait uh, and let's think about it. Well, it's like uh, starting being on a diet from Monday. Start immediately. Facebook is enough to talk to everyone, but personal relationship, even online, will never replace. Uh, uh, social media. And finally, my president says, I can't do it. Well, sign him or her up to the fundraising festival. 9th, 10th, and 11th of June in Riccione and online. Now, Stefano, I think that uh, we have had uh, a very intense afternoon. Uh, it was extremely funny to listen to Dan Palotta, to Stefano Zamani. It was a real challenge. Uh, uh, it was, uh, well, there were also some uh, difficult moments, you know. But I think we opened up our minds uh, also to conflicts. But I think that conflicts are, are at the basis of growth. We understood that uh, we have another mission, educating donors, educating philanthropists, educating. Uh, and this is, is a starting point on which uh, all our speakers agreed. Now, at 6, uh, there is the speed networking. So network uh, as much as you can. Uh, I would like to thank you for your patience, uh, for being with us uh, for four hours from 2 to 6. Uh, so it was a very long streaming. This will be streamed on YouTube starting from tomorrow morning. So if you want to watch it, you can do it on YouTube. So let's now thank uh, participants, uh, the sponsors, the staff. Can we show all the people behind the scenes or isn't that possible? No, you, we can't. Or maybe yes. Okay, there they are. There was a world of people working together with us. So there were all the technicians working today, and uh, they also worked yesterday. So with this wonderful network of people, we would also like to thank Le Tre Civette, uh, the uh, technicians of from Forli, uh, dealing with uh, the technical aspects, uh, the Teatro Piccolo, with, that is empty, but we hope that uh, on the at the beginning of June it can be full again, and that we will meet in Riccione and online for the fundraising festival. We wait for you there. Thank you, thank you, and uh, see you soon.